Great. And then if you just want to hand back the hosting. Great. Okay, should be ready to go. Great. Um, then let's call it to or call the workshop to order um, the June 11th climate and ocean change workshop. Um, we were going to have this workshop in March and a pandemic got in the way. So I'm glad we're able to do it now. Um, and I think before we start introductions or anything like that, Kristen, could you do logistics? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so to introduce myself, my name is Kristen Wright. I work for the National Policy Consensus Center at Portland State University, um, where we advance the use of collaborative governance methods in Oregon and nationally to help people collaborate to address public issues. Um, today, I'm here to help provide technical support to the commission and the ODF and W staff to be able to hold this workshop virtually through Zoom. We're pleased that you're here and on the YouTube stream and appreciate your patience with us as we continue to learn and adapt to this new virtual world. Just a few comments to orient you to the Zoom meeting before I turn this over to Chair Wall. Um, only commissioners and presenting staff will be visible on the screen. Uh, to help with communication and meeting management, we ask that the commissioners and participating staff please keep yourself muted to limit background noise. To find your mute button, it is located at the bottom left hand of your screen. And we just ask that you wait till you're recognized by the chair or vice chair before unmuting yourself to speak. Um, we also will ask you to use the digital hand raise feature to signal if you have a question or a comment and wait to be recognized by the chair. You can find this feature by clicking on the participants logo at the bottom of your screen. This will open a list of meeting participants to your right. And at the bottom of that screen will be a raised hand icon. So you may need to expand your screen to be able to see that icon. Um, I will be tracking the raised hands and at the appropriate time will notify the chair or vice chair that there are raised hands. Um, the uh, chat feature is also available for this meeting um, and it can be distracting for meeting participants. So we ask that you limit your use of the chat in the meeting. And please also understand that the chat will be saved as part of the public record. Uh, if you are a non-participating attendee, that is you're not visible on the screen, you will not be able to mute or unmute yourself, but you will be able to use the raise hand feature, um, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. So some of you may be asked to uh, uh, participate in the meeting. And at that time, I will announce that I'm switching your role from an observer to a participant. There will be a small blip on your screen, and then you will be able to unmute yourself to speak. Your video will also be live at that time. Once your participation is complete, then we will move you back to being an observer. Um, in the event of um, any technical issues, um, I will end the meeting and restart it. So you will need to use the link that you originally joined to rejoin the meeting. Um, in the event of an in, in inappropriate disruption, what some are calling called Zoom bombing, um, I will first try to remove that person from the meeting before rebooting the meeting. So again, we're very pleased to have you with us today. And with that, I will hand it back to Chair Wall. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you to everybody who's here, um, especially to Sean and Davia for the incredible amount of work putting this together um, and to the department for the leadership. Oh God. Um, to even be in this position. Um, this department has taken quite a, uh, has put a lot of work into this and has taken a leadership role in getting us where we are and among the state agencies and a lot of credit for that. If there are people from the public who are following this and listening, thank you for being here. Um, and I think we'll just go ahead and get started, but could I first ask that each of, because we haven't met all of the staff before who are going to be presenting, if the commissioners could each just 
maybe introduce yourself and tell what town you're from or something so that people know you because I think that they haven't met everybody. So if we could start with Commissioner Zarnowitz. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm Commissioner Zarnowitz, Jill Zarnowitz um, from or near the town of Yamhill in Oregon. Thank you. Commissioner Hatfield. Hi, I'm Becky Hatfield Hyde, and I'm excited to be here today and, and hear all of this work. Um, I live in Paisley, Oregon, and spend a lot of time also in Brothers, Oregon, and in uh, the Beatty Chilliquin area. But right now I'm in Paisley. Thank you. Commissioner Spellbrink. Yeah, Bob Spellbrink, uh, Tillets, Oregon. Glad to Thank be here. Thank you. and. Commissioner Woolley. Hi, uh, Commissioner Greg Woolley. I'm vice chair. I'm in the Portland metro area. I'm currently, currently residing in Lake Oswego. Thank you. And Commissioner Labhart, as you most, most of you already heard, will be here soon. Um, I'm Mary Wall. I'm from Langlois. And so if we could just go right to um, Davia and um, Sean to get started. All right, didn't want to unmute me. <laughs> okay, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners, for the record, this is uh, Sean Clements, Senior Policy Analyst with ODFW, and really appreciate your time this afternoon. This is a topic that's obviously very important to us. Um, we've been working on this draft policy for over a year now, and uh, as you know, we had intended to be here back in April adopting this, uh, but best laid plans and all. So we're hoping through this work session that um, we get a sense of how we envision at least this policy, the words in the policy coming to life in, in, terms, in terms of our science and resource management. And we're gonna use several kind of case studies to demonstrate that. We're hoping that at the end, you have a sense of the overall vision and that we address any uncertainty you have about the, um, how the policy will be implemented. And so just to kick it off, while I think that the need for the policy document is, is really no surprise, we just want to spend a couple of minutes up front setting the stage for why we think it's critical that we address these impacts. Um, so next slide. So in the January informational, um, way back in January, it seems years ago, um, I know, but we talked about a lot of the changes that are happening in our environment as a result of the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the ocean. And the examples of these changes are all around us. Um, we've got the marine heat waves that we've seen in the last few years. We've got the lower snowpacks in a lot of, a lot of recent years. Um, we've got warming of streams, wildfires, et cetera. And these changes are all essentially undermining the, the ability of our habitats in Oregon to support the fish and wildlife that we really deeply care about. Next slide. And so again, this is having broad impacts across fish and wildlife, infrastructure and jobs. Um, it is already impacting Oregon and Oregonians and our fish and wildlife, and it will continue to do so um, for the foreseeable future. Um, when we think about infrastructure, you know, the flooding, um, most of their storms, sea level rise, et cetera, is affecting docks and uh, buildings, ports, et cetera. There's a number of jobs that depend on natural resources in Oregon, um, you know, several hundred thousand jobs. Uh, these are all at risk as a result of climate change. And so the bottom line is that, um, you know, when you think across Oregon, uh, we're already experiencing billions of dollars in lost opportunity and rebuilding after impacts occur, and that is not going away anytime soon. It's also threatening the existence of some of the species we care about. So next slide. Just wanna briefly talk about some of the impacts both on the marine, um, marine environment and on land here. In the marine environment, you think of infrastructure along the coast and our ports um, and uh, tide gates, for example, in the low lying lands. Uh, these are all gonna be impacted by sea level rise and increasing storm frequency and storm surges. Uh, out in the ocean, these are uh, pteropods, the base of the food chain. They're being impacted by ocean acidification, which affects their ability to draw calcium out of the water and form a shell. Um, ocean food webs, these are pyrosomes, which turned up on our shores in large numbers in recent years. We're also seeing warm water fish uh, that you typically associate with Hawaii and other areas in our, in our waters. 
So we're seeing in a lot of cases, these fundamental shifts in ocean food webs that are affecting the ability of um, our native species to thrive. Harmful algal blooms, uh, there's been an increase in, in the number of those in recent years and also climate change is expected to increase the uh, toxicity or the amount of production of toxins from these harmful algal blooms. And these again impact our fisheries um, such as crab. And then moving on to acute mortality, uh, this is an example where we had a crab kill associated with hypoxia off the coast. And we're seeing more of these hypoxic events and more acute mortality events. Next slide. So moving inland, um, we have a whole range of impacts that we're currently experiencing and expect to worsen over time. Again, infrastructure, um, if you think about our docks uh, around lakes and waterways and impact of uh, increasing storm severity and flood, flood severity on those. When we look at invaders, this is an example of mountain pine beetle, which is increasing in severity and frequency in some, some locations across Oregon. Um, when you think about smallmouth bass, for example, we're seeing increases in, in the upstream distribution of smallmouth bass and systems like the Umpqua and John Day. As these systems warm, it allows increasing distribution of um, invasive species. We're still also seeing rain shifts. Um, as these higher elevation areas become, uh, become kind of isolated, we're seeing um, shifts in range from lower elevation to higher elevation. Uh, we're also seeing um, fragmentation of the habitat both again because of changing um, climate, uh, fire, and thermal barriers and streams. And then finally, we're also seeing more incidences of acute mortality um, in fish associated with high temperatures. We had several fish kills in 2015 associated with high temperatures then. And then also in wildlife associated with uh, decreased forage in some cases. So um, a lot of impacts overall. Uh, a key point here is that with the exception of ocean acidification and hypoxia, these threats are things that we're already familiar with um, that we've already accounted for in a lot of our planning and management. The difference here is that climate change is exacerbating to um, you know, a fairly large degree in some cases, the, uh, the magnitude of these threats. And although there's gonna to continue to be cycles, uh, ups and downs, the, the, um, the unique thing about climate change is that we're on a general tra trajectory towards things worsening over time. And there is this potential for tipping points, such as with ocean acidification in the ocean. So it's, it's unique, but it's also familiar. And that's a theme that you'll see throughout the talk. Um, and when you think about you know, the implementation of this policy, we have to keep in mind that a lot of these threats we've been dealing with, this is just a, an, an overlay that we have to consider. And so with that, I think Davi is going to talk more, more about where we're at with the policy. Thanks, Sean. Um, Chair Wall, members of the commission, for the record, my name is Davia Palmieri. I am the conservation policy coordinator in the director's office for the department. Um, and I'm kind of kind of pick up where, where Sean left off on the science, what we're seeing um, and what's been observed and what's likely to, to come for Oregon to the, the policy status. So on March 10th, uh, which would have been really good timing with our, our previously planned workshop, Governor Brown signed Executive Order 20-04 directing state agencies to take actions to reduce and regulate greenhouse gas emissions. The order establishes new greenhouse gas emissions reductions for the state, uh, including at least 45% below 1990 emissions level by 2035, and at least 80% below 1990 emission levels by 2050. It provides general directives to many state agencies and specific directives to a few agencies. Um, and those directives are about using existing authority to implement new programs um, for example, uh, DEQ to uh, implement a greenhouse gas cap and reduce program, a food waste reduction program, and landfill emissions reductions, and Department of Energy for new energy efficiency standards um, in, in all sorts of sectors. The department is a named agency in this order, um, in, in the general section of the order. We're directed to consider and integrate climate change, climate change impacts, and the state greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals into our planning, budgets, investments, and policymaking decisions. The agencies identified in the order were also asked to expedite processes uh, related to greenhouse gas reductions and to report on uh, proposed actions by May 15th of this year. So the department did submit a report to the governor on May 15th of this year. 
And um, the reason that we thought it was really relevant to bring this in um, now is that um, the, the report we submitted on May 15th really highlighted the draft climate and ocean change policy as the primary mechanism by which the department can meet the mandates of the executive order, including through increased statewide coordination, which we'll talk about today, and through the key principles in the policy uh, being integrated into future planning budgets, investments, and policy making decisions, um, exactly how, how the executive order phrases it. Um, also in our report on May 15th, which you guys do have a copy of, uh, we highlighted some opportunities to excel, accelerate replacement of outdated and inefficient infrastructure that the department and other state agencies own and operate, and to help transition to zero emissions vehicles. So that's some context for, for the importance of the policy, and we're here today to talk about the policy, but our intent is to do that by demonstrating how the department can and does consider climate change and fish and wildlife management. We discussed the detailed provisions of the policy at our January informational meeting, and um, we'll do so again at the July meeting when um, the commission considers adopting the OARs for the policy. But today we're gonna to focus more on how the key principles uh, and the coordination concepts from the policy are already in action and can serve as examples for what implementing the policy will look like. So the policy, like Sean said, has been uh, in the works for, for over a year, and uh, it has its origins in the um, department strategic plan, which is a few years old. That plan called for the identify, uh, identification of uh, focal issues, uh, five issues that uh, really require focused attention from the department to make progress on. Um, the issue has identified were public access, water quality and quantity, wildlife disease invasive species, elk damage and climate change. You'll notice that those are five distinct focal issues, but many of them have a nexus to climate change. So working on this policy was a really great starting point to, to address many of those things. So a team of staff from across the agency from headquarters in the field um, worked to develop the policy um, over the last year and then went under, underwent review by other staff and um, scrutiny by the public. One piece of the policy that uh, I just wanted to highlight today is the vision statement. And I'll call your attention to the emphasis on the needed science and proactive leadership. We'll talk about a couple of elements of that today. Um, and also that what is good for fish and wildlife is typically good for the state and for Oregonians in general. We think that's a critical message that's often overlooked. We're not planning for adaptation for just fish and wildlife, but for Oregonians in general. So I'll just remind you um, that the policy really has uh, five uh, pillars that, were, that will guide how we implement it. Um, it calls for ODFW to engage with other state agencies in a proactive approach to coordinating where adaptation action should be prioritized across the state. It identifies key principles that should become a part of all of ODFW's science and research and resource management commits to a goal of ODFW's operations becoming carbon neutral by mid-century, which exceeds the new um, statewide goals in the executive order, and directs the department uh, to develop a communication strategy for engaging the public in understanding and addressing climate change and its impacts on fish and wildlife. So today we're really gonna focus on the first three pillars here. And like I said, when we come back in July, we'll really go into the details of what's in the policy. Uh, we've separated this presentation into two sections. The first will focus on good habitat as the foundation for healthy fish and wildlife populations. Improving habitat and focusing conservation on the most resilient remaining habitat gives fish and wildlife populations their best chance to persist on the landscape despite changing conditions. And the second section uh, will focus on managing risk in direct management of fish and wildlife populations. We need to ensure that the public use and enjoyment of fish and wildlife is at a scale that continues to avoid negative impacts to the long-term conservation of species. Staff will share examples of how we manage that risk now and how the department can continue to allow for public opportunity in the short term while paying attention to the long-term and avoiding long-term detrimental impacts uh, to the conservation of species that we manage. Uh, so I'll kick off section one uh, now with habitat. Uh, and like I said, and good habitat is absolutely critical to the long-term persistence of Oregon's fish and wildlife. The draft policy highlights the need to work with other state agencies um, who in many cases uh, have a nexus or a regulatory authority 
uh, to Oregon's lands and waters. Uh, we need to work with those agent agencies to identify high priority areas for fish and wildlife in balance with the other adaptation priorities of the state. The policy also sets up a framework by which the department should give the highest priority to currently, func currently high functioning habitat and habitat that's likely to remain high functioning into the future. So uh, the, the idea that habitat is uh, uh, core to healthy fish and wildlife populations is not a new thing. Um, but we do know that as a response to climate change, it becomes even more important and we need to do much more. Um, that habitat needs to be there to allow species to um, uh, implement their own adaptive capacity and maybe remain in place uh, to allow species to move to new places on the landscape or new microhabitats uh, that offer the right climate conditions or other mechanisms. We also know that we need to uh, do more in our science. We need to identify the most vulnerable and most resilient habitats. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. We also need to um, know more about what it is about habitat uh, that supports a certain species and maybe not others. And we'll talk a little bit more about the science of that today. Uh, we also need to increase the scale of our habitat work and really focus in on those areas that are the most resilient. And finally, we'll talk about uh, the need for a coordinated response. The, the policy that we'll talk about next month really provides direction to the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, and it includes direction for our staff to work with other agencies. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more today about how that really could, could function in practice. So our first presenter is Darren Clark. He's the East Region Wildlife Research Project Leader and he's going to talk about key research in this darky experimental forest that is helping us understand how climate change is impacting the ability of habitat to support um, ungulates in that forest. So I'll turn it over to Darren. Right. Thank you, Davia, for the record, uh, Terry Wild Commissioners. My name is Darren Clark. I'm the Wildlife Research Project Leader for the East Region, and I'm based out of La Grande, Oregon. Uh, so there's been a wealth of knowledge collected on ungulates throughout the Western North America, particularly mule deer and elk. Uh, that has highlighted the importance of habitat for these species and how this affects their population performance. This primarily occurs through habitat influencing the nutritional resources available to both mule deer and elk in uh, places they reside. And ultimately this influences the fat reserves of females. And the body fat of females has cascading demographic consequences for the entire population. Specifically, uh, females with reduced body fat tend to have reduced pregnancy rates they have later birth dates of, or parturition dates of their fawns or calves, which leads to reduced gr growth rates of these fawns and calves and ultimately reduced survival of these fawns and calves. If their body fat is low enough on these females entering winter, they will typically also have reduced survival rates over winter. And ultimately all these demographic factors related to uh, productivity, uh, birth dates, survival rates, directly influence population growth rates or the size of our mule deer and elk populations. And based on the estimates ODFW generates, this then determines the harvest opportunity that we have. So this is sort of the background information on how nutrition and habitat is critical for determining population size of ungulates. And I'm going to move on to some more specific examples. Uh, next slide, please. And most of what I'll be talking about comes from the Starkey Experimental Forest and Range. And in 1989, we started the Starkey Project, which was a joint venture between Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Pacific Northwest Research Center of the Forest Service. We've been conducting long-term studies on both mule deer and elk inside the Starkey Project fence uh, to look at effects of land management and recreational disturbance on mule deer and elk populations. So we've accumulated over 30 years of data on mule deer and elk movements, but we have also collected metrics on several other things, including climate variables, and on this slide here, uh, we have rep representations of two factors that are changing due to ongoing climate change. Between 1990 and approximately 2017, we've seen a uh, about a one and a half degree Celsius increase in temperature, which is about a three degree Fahrenheit change in our annual daily temperature, um, which is a substantial increase over that time. We've also seen that our snowpack depth in March, 
the rise we're about to enter spring, has declined by about four to five inches over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, so we have less snow in March, um, which changes the green up dynamics of forage. And yeah, next slide, it's fine. So every year at Starkey, we have elk voluntarily enter our winter feed ground where we're able to uh, handle all of them and measure body fat of females as they enter the facility. And so on the Y axis here, we have mean body fat of elk entering winter. And then each dot is a year of measurement. And then you see the general relationship fitted there with the line. We see as we've increased mean annual temperatures, we see females are entering winter with reduced body fat. And we also see as we increase snowpack depth in March, we also we have an increase in body fat of these females. And what is the mechanism that's driving this? It's probably related to plant phenology. Next slide, please. Which plant phenology relates to the timing of green up, the length of growing season, the timing of senescence. We've collected plot level data from 1991 and 1990 to 1996 and compared this to 2015 to 2019. And these graphs here are showing patterns for forbs, which are a uh, dominant item in the diets of both mule deer and elk. And so the blue bars represent uh, the 1990 data and the red bars represent the 2015 to 2019 data. What we see in the, the panel on the left, we have three dominant habitat type or vegetation associations, grasslands, open pine, and mixed conifer. And then on the wax, we're looking at days of growth. And what we see is on average, our growing season for forbs has declined by about 23 days. We see a similar pattern for grass species, which are also an important forage component for ungulates. In the right graph, similar, the same three vegetation associations, but we're looking at the timing of senescence. So when these plants cure and decline in nutritional quality as a forage resource. We're seeing that plants are senescing approximately 17 days earlier between these two time frames. And once again, we're seeing a similar pattern for grasses across these vegetation associations. Um, and what, ultimately what this results in is with the shorter growing season, uh, we end up with less biomass out there. Plants don't grow as big anymore. And they're probably also of less nutritional quality due to senescence occurring earlier. So we have a shorter growing winter with less food and the quality of food on average has probably declined as a result of changes in plant phenology. Uh, next slide, please. We have also done some more intensive vegetation sampling where we're looking at uh, biomass and then also uh, the quality of the forage is measured by dietary digestible energy. And this graph represents uh, dietary digestible energy on the y-axis, so higher quality forage is represented by a larger number. And then we have the five plant associations that occur at the Starkey Experimental Forest and Range. We had uh, four sampling periods, spring of 2016, spring of 2017, and then summer of both those same years. And summer usually has lower quality forage just because plants are senescing as we get into summer, so spring's usually better. But the key take home from this graph is that orange or yellow line at approximately 12 kilojoules per gram of forage, that is the energy requirements of a female mule deer during peak lactation with one fawn. Uh, the energy demands go up higher than that when they do have two fawns. And what this suggests is our current forage conditions do not support peak lactation demands of females, which should have some pretty substantial consequences for mule deer populations. Uh, that suggests they're gonna have to struggle to raise a fawn um, to live to be an adult and recruit the next year. The blue line represents the energetic demands of a female that's not lactating, just her baseline energetic demands. At this point, we are still meeting those from a forage standpoint, uh, but in some cases, you know, summer 2017, we're getting down there pretty close to not even meeting their baseline energy requirements. And at those levels, these females might still be nutritionally stressed entering winter and hard winters might take a toll on them. Uh, next slide, please. But we do have some options to improve forage conditions for both de mule deer and elk. Uh, these pictures show an example of a thinning treatment. Uh, so there's a before and after photo there where they've gone and then removed a bunch of understory conifers that were encroaching. Those dense conifer stands don't allow light penetration of the forest floor and foods that are of high quality to mule deer and elk no longer grow in those areas. So these thinning treatments take these conditions from low quality nutritional resources to, both, to high quality nutritional resources. 
So there are some options to manipulate habitat and vegetation cover to benefit both mule deer and elk. Uh, next slide, please. And as an added benefit, one of the consequences of ongoing climate change is higher risk of more and potentially more severe fires. So these types of vegetation treatments can also reduce the risk of stand replacing fire. There's always still a chance of a stand replacing fire depending on conditions, but opening up that understory and reducing some of the ladder fuels should reduce some of the risk of a very high severity burn moving through that particular area. So next slide, please. And so getting back here to how habitat influences population productivity of mule deer and elk. So we know that climate change and vegetation management are likely to influence habitat. There's some uncertainty of how exactly that might play out. Um, some conditions may be beneficial. Say we have less severe winters, we might see reduced overwinter mortality, but there's less forage in the summer, which might reduce productivity. So some of these factors will still have to play out. There is still some uncertainty in exactly how habitat and ultimately mule deer and elk populations will be affected. But we might be able to mitigate some of the effects of climate change through vegetation management, through uh, practices we know that will increase forage resources for mule deer and elk. This does require us to reach out and conduct interagency partnerships. Our land managers with both BLM, uh, the Forest Service, and then industrial timberlands um, may provide some opportunities to increase forage resources for mule deer and elk in the face of ongoing climate change. But ultimately, how does this how are we going to manage risk with this certainty? We're going to keep doing what we do as an agency. Every year annually, we collect survey data, population estimates, and harvest data on our mule deer and elk herds to develop defensible population estimates. And so we assess the population health through these estimates we develop, which then allows us to allocate tags and harvest opportunity, even in facing uncertainty. Um, Given we collect this data annually, we are able to assess annually how the herd is doing and are able to manipulate our tag numbers appropriately uh, to ensure we do not over harvest and threaten the long term conservation and viability of local populations and the overall populations throughout the state. And with that, I think that is my last slide. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. I think we'll pause if there's any questions. Oh, do you want questions now, Davia, or do you want people? Commissioners, any of you have questions right now? Nope. I see no raised hands. Uh, Chair Wall, I could. Yes. Uh, this is Sean again. I just want to, um, you know, point back to the policy for folks, and so. You know, Darren's given a really nice example of how you might take those some of those key science principles and and understand what they look like in practice. So when you look at um, the department using anal analytic approaches to determine how species, biological communities, and habitats might respond to climate change, mm -hmm. and conducting research to look at some of the critical uncertainties or reducing those uncertainties so that we can manage better in the future, I think. The research that he's just presented um, and talked about is a perfect example of what that looks like in practice. Thank you, Sean. Um, one question I have is, we keep hearing that there, we need to prioritize and look at, at the habitats that will remain. So, and I think both of you mentioned that. Can you talk about how much we know about like the percentage of habitat we have compared left, how much of resilient habitat is left compared to say 50 years ago? This is Darren Chairwall, commissioners. Um, I haven't specifically done that from an assessment of what is left. Uh, mule deer and elk have pretty varied habitat requirements and can live in a variety of areas. So. We have mule deer living in sagebrush ecosystems all the way to the crest of the Cascades in conifer forests. So there is a range of conditions. So they have plenty of opportunities. Some things that have changed um, have probably reduced the quality of their habitat, but not necessarily a large degree, some of the quantity of their habitat. Uh, so most of our forested areas in Eastern Oregon are national forests. So they have been protected. Nothing's been lost to development. Uh, winter range habitats have probably seen some reductions um, in quantity, uh, 
and potentially quality due to climate change. Uh, a lot of the reduction in quantity is related to human development on big game winter range. Uh, big areas like around Bend, uh, on growing growth there into some of the low elevation sites that mule deer migrate into. That has been lost, and I, I, but I can't quantify that number. Thank you. One last question on the, at least two of you have, of the presenters have already said we have to do more. We have to do more of the kind of projects you talked about, Darren, and others if we're going to keep, if we're going to support these um, populations. And is that in already starting to pull you away from other work? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners, uh, from my viewpoint, um, it's not pulling us away from other work. It's just climate change is something we know we need to account for in all of our ongoing research. Um, we know it's going to have an effect on wildlife, so it's something we need to consider when we're designing our studies. Uh, a lot of what we do is trying to understand, say, ongoing declines of mule deer populations currently. Climate change is something we are considering as a variable that could be important and we need to account for when conducting these studies. Um, but I don't view it as shifting my work from any direction that we wouldn't be going already. Thank you. Chair, sure, well, um, just to add to that, I think um, in some cases we're looking at reprioritizing some of our resources towards collecting information that is going to be critical to understand the risks for climate change and how to respond to them. Um, so in some cases we will be shifting resources away from things that we've currently done towards that. And it's in a recognition of, you know, we have we have the resources we have, what's the best use of those? Thank you. And Commissioner Labhart and Commissioner Woolley have their hands raised. Commissioner Labhart, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, thanks for the presentation, Darren and Sean. So I have a, it's kind of a general question related to climate change. As, as the climate does change and we get warmer and habitats change, we'll see a, a movement of wildlife to respond to that. And we see that you know, right now in terms of winter range habitat, we're seeing a significant amount of animals moving down onto private ground and off of the, the federal ground and private ground that has forests on there. Um, you know, the takeaway for me on all of this is about habitat, habitat, and habitat. Um, do you have a perspective, each of you, on from the research that's been done at Starkey and other places about habitat on federal lands and the work that's being done on federal lands to try to improve habitat, either through pre-commercial, commercial thinnings, uh, brush clearing, prescribed burning, those kind of things? Are we way behind? I, I think I probably know the answer, but are we way behind? Do we need to do more? to address what we perceive or not perceive as we know that climate is changing and habitat conditions change to try to keep our animals in the best uh, nutritious condition as possible. Uh, Commissioner Labhart, Chair Wall, other commissioners, um, I would say at this point we have enough science conducted to understand what conditions are needed to encourage primarily elk. Um, they're the ones that are causing most of the damage issues and being on private land during winters uh, to encourage them to stay on public lands. A lot of it is related to vegetation management, but also in conjunction with uh, road management. Um, so conducting targeted thinning treatments and strategic road closures can encourage elk to stay on public lands longer. Um, other research has shown the vegetation available in those treated areas of is of higher quality than say agricultural lands down lower. The plants there are better for both mule deer and elk than, say, an alfalfa field. So I think we know what we need to do, um, but the key is developing those interagency partnerships. Uh, you know, in the Blue Mountains, that's primarily with the Forest Service to try and encourage projects to go through that may be beneficial to elk, but also elk and mule deer, but also meet other goals such as reducing fire risk and some of those thinning opportunities that could occur. Um, are we behind? Yeah, there's been decades of fire suppression, other things that have led to ingrowth in conifers on forested lands. So there's a lot of acres to treat, but I think it's doable if we can start building some effective partnerships to move some of these projects forward. Um, and there are examples of that. The Blue Mountain Elk Initiative has been around for 25 plus years, focuses on issues just like that. It's a collaborative effort between ODFW, tribes, federal government to try and push some of these projects through to benefit uh, 
elk on public lands. Thank you. Two things, um, Commissioner Woolley, you will be next. And um, Kristen, can I just mention that I'm not seeing and the raised hand. So if you can call on people, that would be great. And I do have one quick comment when Commissioner Woolley is finished. Okay, that sounds good. <clears throat> okay, okay. Um, thank you, Chair. So we've known for decades that opening up dense stands of conifers does provide additional forage opportunities for ungulates. And it hasn't been without controversy. Uh, oftentimes it's been perceived as uh, just a way to increase timber volume. And so I, I, this is just a comment, you know, so I feel that, you know, communication and conversations and education will be real important. Um, it, you know, we are going to make an effort to increase this method for um, providing more uh, viable forage for ungulates. Uh, we do need to work with the public and not just the public agencies uh, so that everybody has an understanding and, and they can better weigh the, the pros and cons of, of this method uh, because we know it works. Uh, but it's not necessarily trusted by everyone in terms of its stated objective. And so it's just a comment about, you know, how inclusive we need to be uh, with communication. It's not going to be just partnerships with the public agencies, but also with the public at large. Thank you. I'm going to pass on making the comment just so we can go on to the next one and I'll make it later. So um, I think I'm sorry to interrupt. Back. Chair Wall, uh, I believe Commissioner Zarnowitz has her hand raised. Oh, okay, go ahead, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Yeah, uh, this is Jill Zarnowitz, Commissioner. Um, I just wanted to say that the uh, it's interesting. This is a great study, the Starkey uh, project, and um, it wound up having a, a lot more um, results than I think the original um, project expected to have back in 1989. Um, cause I, from what I recall, the original purpose was more just trying to find out how elk and deer use the habitat, um, in that area and, and to confine them so that you could keep track of them and, and basically keep track of every single animal in, within the, the large fenced area. So it's great to see that it's produced even more than what I think was originally expected. Thank you. Commissioner Hyde, you have your hand up as well. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, I, what I like about this example is um, I, you know, we hear uh, every day the alarms around climate change, but I like this example because it's a way to ground ourselves in some of the like, this is what we need to do for those people that are more tasky and, you know, wanting to do something rather than just that, you know, broad alarm. So I'm, I'm really thankful um, that Darren um, gave this presentation. And um, so that's just what I, what I think. And I'm going to go back on mute. Thank you. Should we go to Anna Packenham Stevenson? So this is Javia and I, I've got a little transition here to, to get into Anna's presentation. Um, so the next uh, series of presentations uh, are gonna really focus on the idea of doing more to identify our most vulnerable and most resilient habitats and put a greater focus on those habitats. Um, so doing these assessments uh, helps us understand the current ability of Oregon's lands and waters to support fish and wildlife now and looking into the future. And doing that assessment allows us to look across the landscape and identify areas um, for putting our priority emphasis and putting our focus um, as a department, but also as a state. Uh, we are able to share these with our partners. 
Um, so this can help us move beyond random acts of conservation, uh, which some people say are the postage stamp approach to conservation, to make sure we're making the most efficient use of the conservation resources that we do have. Um, so we do have conservation opportunity areas as part of the Oregon Conservation Strategy, and both of the efforts you're about to see from Anna and Rachel um, add more information to that prioritization to make it more climate relevant um, and have all, have all of them have applications um, through all the conservation work that we do. So I'll turn it over to Anna Packenham Stevenson, who's our water program manager. Ooh, I think there's something wrong with my video. Okay. Sorry for those technical difficulties. Uh, for the record, my name is Anna Packingham Stevenson. I'm the water program manager here at ODFNW. Thank you all for this opportunity to talk to you about our statewide aquatic habitat prioritization process. Um, this is a project um, that Davia mentioned builds on a lot of principles and strategies we have inherent at ODFNW uh, through the conservation plan, uh, conservation strategy, Oregon plan for salmon and uh, watersheds, and a lot of the prioritization processes that we've engaged in across our agency to focus the work we do. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is building on that work with a climate change focus. Um, and more data rich uh, information so that we can be more strategic about our investments. The reason why this is particularly important um, is aquatic habitat um, across the state has a patchwork of habitat quality from good to bad to quite ugly. Um, and it's a function of the legacy of development and regulatory actions across the landscape. In order for us to have meaningful uh, results on the ground for fish and wildlife species, um, like Davia mentioned, we need to focus our investments. Uh, we need to focus and protect the best of what is there today and focus restoration areas where we're going to have the highest benefit. Um, and we do that through both protection actions and restoration actions uh, across our agency. Next slide, please. So the steps in the aquatic habitat prioritization process start with um, assembling of data. Uh, so pulling together the relevant data sources that we have. Our components primarily consist of the managed flow regimes and biological targets, biologically relevant temperature, and human impacts across the adjacent landscape. We are going to then integrate that information, um, then apply a prioritization scheme. Uh, we are going to optimize the data layers and information uh, to reduce habitat fragmentation. So again, across an aquatic uh, framework, we want to make sure there's corridors to the habitat that is most important to species. And then, of course, we need to ground tooth this data with um, our district biologists and people across our agency to make sure that it's biologically relevant. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned, we're looking at three different components. Uh, we're looking at stream temperature at the reach scale. We're relying both on empirical and model data in all of these efforts. Uh, for stream temperature, we're looking at the Norwest data set that was developed out of Boise uh, from the US Forest Service and USDA. They rely on gauge data to develop modeled uh, stream temperature across um, at the reach scale across the landscape. And we have this data available for Oregon. For flow data, we're using um, USGS stream stats, gauge data, and Oregon water resources uh, water availability data. And then for the physical habitat, we're looking at the effect of basically land alteration using and building upon the National Fish Habitat Action Plan or NIFHAP um, using data layers such as population density, roads, and land cover. So the combination of these three primary data sets, again, with district feedback, um, are the primary components um, of the, the data that are going into these analyses. Next slide, please. So those are the physical components that are going into um, the analyses, but then you need to couple that with a biological criteria. I'm gonna give you two examples of how we're gonna do this. Um, the first is with stream temperature. Um, out of the red group, Kara Anloff Don has been conducting uh, temperature species uh, thermal tolerance studies uh, in the field. And where you look at the different temperature thresholds um, and biological performances across species to group them into guilds. And you're able to identify temperature tolerances or maximum performance across species to let us know which stream temperatures are most appropriate for different species. Another example is the flow data that is conducted within my program, uh, where we go out and collect substrate depth, velocity, and cover data in the field. Um, and then we compare that and couple that with species uses to generate a weighted usable area for habitat suitability. 
So these are biological criteria that we can couple uh, with the physical habitat data that we have. Next slide, please. To determine overall suitability stream of stream reaches. And then we're doing this both currently, what does the current conditions look like, but also in the future of climate change. So the Norwest data has already built into it the ability to look at climate change impacts. Uh, we're using uh, stream flow permanence as well. And then we're also using the VIC variable intra, uh, in, variable infiltration capacity model uh, to be able to model flows into the future. And so this is where I think we're really starting to push for the principles of the climate strategy to look not only how our current conditions today, but how they will look in the future and how does that affect our decision making. Next slide, please. So the outcome of this project is um, the identification of priority areas for species across a landscape. Um, clear priorities for uh, and clear priorities for temperature and flow targets in these priority areas as well. So we can say where we're the most resilient areas will be, where we should be protecting most vulnerable populations. Um, and again, it will be focused investment in these areas. Next step, slides. And so this is not just for our internal work because we wanna make sure us as an agency, we're all rowing in the same direction, but also in like you've heard many times now about external partners and statewide coordination. Internally, we're using these priorities to develop implementation, uh, development implementation of our conservation plans. Um, we will be using these priorities to comment and develop on regulatory actions and focus our mitigation obligations. Um, they will focus and refine our internal agency priorities, such as where do we focus in stream water rights and where are our passage priorities, and they will be feed, feed into um, things like our conservation strategy as well. We'll be using these to focus science, monitoring, and research, focus implementation in terms of our own agency work, and in general alignment of, of our work across our agency. Externally, we're using these uh, priorities to uh, focus agency investments, such as OWEB funding, WRD funding. We want to be able to use these priorities to coordinate mitigation obligations across the agencies that we work with. And probably, as you know, across the aquatic landscapes, the greatest lift what we're going to see is through restoration work. And you need partners and NGOs to be able to do this work in the future. And so we want to be using these priorities to communicate and work with our partners to provide meaningful uplift in these areas as well. Thank you. Are there questions for Anna at this time? I have one, one question, Anna, and it's kind of a general question. Um, you, it's terrific that we're knowing more about what the future conditions will be and we'll be able to focus our investments. My question is, how is this actually changing what our management plans are gonna look like? And if, or if you wanna just take the example of the in-stream focus, are we at risk of having more fall off the table or are we more in the position of being able to protect and restore more as, as a result of this work? I think we're gonna be in the position of protecting and restoring more. Um, certainly for the in-stream work, we will certainly be protecting areas that will have the most meaningful impact. So we will apply for in-stream protections in these areas. But for restoration, um, if I think you've heard this over and over again, the patchwork of conservation or the stamp post, by focusing investments in areas that are highest priorities and have corridor effects, um, we're gonna have the biggest impact on the landscape. There are currently great partners doing great work, um, but if we're able to leverage that work and focus in areas that are going to have the greatest impact, I think the effect that we're going to see on the ground will be more meaningful. Um, we need to, I think Tom Stahl always says this, be rowing in the same direction, and I agree with that. Um, and that comes within our own agency, working with our partner agencies, um, and then also working with our non-agency partners too, to make sure that we're um, focusing in the same places that will have the most meaningful impact. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Labhart. Yes, thank you, Anna, great presentation. I'm just gonna make you feel good here. The, the external part there were the agency investments, so strategically, OWEB, uh, water resources and grant funding with OWEB. Uh, today, we just approved a $2.6 million purchase of the Pridey Ranch, which is Trout Creek, which provides 30% of the wild steelhead population to the Deschutes River. 
It's got 100 beaver dams on it. It was a focused investment partnership. It was right down the alley of strategic implementation. And so it, that we put our money where our mouth is. So uh, we should all feel pretty good about that. Thanks. Terrific. That's terrific. Great example. Thank you. Then back to you, Davia. Uh, OK, so. Um, I'm with you with the for a short time here to uh, introduce our next speaker. So that was uh, a pretty uh, aquatic habitat focused example. And we've got a really similar habit, uh, example from the terrestrial side um, from Rachel Wheat, who's our con uh, wildlife connectivity coordinator, who's gonna talk about the Oregon Connectivity Assessment and Mapping Project. Thank you. Thank you, Davia. Chair Wall, commissioners, for the record, my name is Rachel Wheat. I'm the Wildlife Connectivity Coordinator for the agency. I work in our conservation program in the Wildlife Division. So just to start this off with some background information, in 2016, ODFW went through a process to revise the Oregon Conservation Strategy. And during this revision process, ODFW identified seven key conservation issues, which are landscape level threats to the state species and their habitats. And one of those threats is the loss of habitat connectivity which is captured in a key conservation issue called barriers to animal movement. Habitat connectivity also plays a significant role in the climate change, land use change, and water quality and quantity key conservation issues. During the revision process of the Oregon Conservation Strategy and alongside the identification of those key conservation issues, it was clear that wildlife connectivity issues in the state really needed greater attention. And this led ODFW to work with partner groups to found an organization called the Oregon Habitat Connectivity Consortium in late 2016, which has grown to include the organizations that you see listed here, ODFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Oregon Department of Transportation, Portland State University, Oregon Wild Foundation, and then some other groups. It also led the agency to hire for my position, the Wildlife Connectivity Coordinator, the following year. And my role within the agency is to coordinate efforts statewide to enhance and protect connectivity for wildlife. And my primary focus over the next several years is the Oregon Connectivity Assessment and Mapping Project, or OCAMP, which we launched uh, in December of last year. So it's only been going on for a few months now. OCAMP is a three-year effort to assess and map connectivity for more than 50 wildlife species across their respective ranges in Oregon. These species connectivity models will be compiled to highlight priority wildlife corridors for all terrestrial wildlife in the state. Next slide, please. OCAMP products will have a utility for a wide variety of our agency's need, as well as those of our partners, but the relevance to our efforts to address climate change is really this. Maintenance and restoration of habitat connectivity is the most frequently proposed strategy to aid wildlife in adapting to changing climates. There has been no better proposed technique to help wildlife react to climate change than to ensure that they can move freely to access suitable habitat. Next slide. The products from the Oregon Connectivity Assessment and Mapping Project will highlight statewide priorities for enhancing and protecting connectivity for Oregon's wildlife. OCAMP products will represent existing connectivity for species, so not explicitly modeling for potential future shifts in connectivity due to changing climates, but the prioritization of wildlife corridors will take climate change into consideration by incorporating information on geophysically diverse areas that are expected to be climate resilient. And the species that we've selected for OCAMP represent a diversity of taxa, not just the large bodied, highly mobile habitat generalists that we often think of when discussing connectivity issues like deer and elk, but also smaller bodied species that rely on specific habitat types or specific habitat structural characteristics. OCAMP species include mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and even a few invertebrates, and represent a wide variety of life history strategies, dispersal capabilities, movement types, and sensitivity to anthropogenic threats. Next slide. So this image here represents an idea of what this all might look like in practice. The area you see highlighted in yellow is a theoretical example of what a priority corridor might look like for a species near Highway 97, north of Redmond. If we then start compiling priority corridors for additional species, next slide, like this species in orange, next slide, a third species in green, next slide, and a fourth species in blue, we can start to see some patterns emergency, emerging that can be used for on the ground action, next slide. <laughs> 
For example, the area you see here circled in white is a location where three of the species corridors overlap, and that might be a potential target area for working with our partners to ensure that connection is not lost. Next slide. And this area is a location where the three species corridors narrow considerably and all cross Highway 97. And that could be a target for working with the Oregon Department of Transportation to consider mitigating for wildlife passage at this location to prevent wildlife vehicle collisions. Next slide. By identifying and then working to enhance and protect these corridors for wildlife in Oregon, we help ensure that species can react and adapt to changing climates. Landscape connectivity is key to maintaining genetic diversity within populations. It allows wildlife to disperse into newly suitable habitat as it forms and out of habitat that becomes less suitable. And landscape connectivity can also aid wildlife in escaping dis disturbance events that are expected to increase in frequency and severity under changing climate conditions, such as stream drying events, flooding, and wildfire. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner Labhart. Sorry, sorry for taking so much time here, but I just can't help but weigh in on this one too, because I think this one's extremely important. And you know, the, the research just has shown that the Highway 97 South project, the fencing project and the underpass down there has reduced uh, wildlife impacts for vehicles by 90%. And that's not only good for the wildlife, it's good for the people that are in the cars, it's good for the insurance industry, and it's good overall. And now we've just got the Gilkes project done and the Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund Advisory Committee is looking at the possibility of potentially using some funds there to complete that project because OHA and some other groups are working with ODOT to raise the money now for that fencing project there. So uh, this is a classic example where this uh, ODOT, uh, Oregon Code of Connectivity Assessment Mapping Project would, would help and, and for future projects as she's identified. So thank you. That's great. Rachel, I have one question as well. I keep trying to get an idea of, for instance, on the on the connectivity areas, do you have a guess of, or it wouldn't be a guess, but do you know how we're doing on this? Are we way behind the eight ball and we're trying to catch up? Are we doing pretty well in identifying and protecting these areas? What's the, what's the general condition? Chair sure. Wall, with respect to Oregon and identifying connectivity corridors in the state, we are a little bit behind the ball. Um, we've seen similar statewide connectivity efforts come out of neighboring states, uh, Washington in 2012 and California in 2010. Um, so we're, we're a bit behind the times. The benefit to starting now is that we have access to a lot of additional spatial data and geophysical modeling techniques that have been developed over the past decade. That, that really leverage our utility to be able to address these issues at fine resolutions and for multiple spe species. So ultimately, although we haven't identified nearly as many priority quarters as neighboring states, um, our models will, uh, they'll be better essentially, they'll be more robust. And Commissioner Hatfield Hyde has her hand raised. Go ahead, Commissioner. Um, Rachel, I just wanna say that this is, um, such exciting work um, that you get to be doing. And again, I like it because uh, um, the layering and the mapping I think is, is just a really neat way for lay people to also understand what you're trying to get at. It's, um, um, I've spent a lot of years looking at complicated uh, graphs in the Klamath and I, I often feel like we're unable to say, hey, I have no clue what you're talking about, but this kind of uh, mapping is is really neat because it's just so obvious. Um, my question is, in your partnership, uh, do you guys have a way to reach out to the private landowner community in your partnership? Because I didn't notice, I, I don't know if that's happening or um, possible or, so that's my question. Thank you. Commissioner sure, Hadfield, Chair Wall, Commissioners. Um, we do try to reach as many constituents in the state of Oregon as possible. We have uh, what we're calling the OCAMP network, which is an email listserv of more than a thousand individuals now um, for which we provide progress updates on the project on at least a six month interval. And um, 
we try to send out press releases and, and emails to the broadest diversity of groups possible, including private landowners. Um, since the project just started, some of this news has been slow to take off. So we know that there are still individuals and groups that we haven't reached yet that just don't don't have the awareness of the project yet to become involved or at least informed. But as we move forward, the, the goal is to reach as many of those constituencies as possible. Um, for example, we have members of the OCAMP network from the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, from private timber landowners on the coast, um, in addition to some of those state, federal, and NGO partners. I think Commissioner Woolley has his hands raised. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yes. Um, so you were alluding about um, partnerships, including ODOT, and of course ODOT is, is a very necessary partner in this work. So I was curious about um, how it's going and working with ODOT and if you know, our departments are on the same page with the urgency. I know that uh, funding, transportation funding is often lacking and uh, it's challenging. And, and that's one reason why uh, private partnerships are important. And you know, we've seen that in Colorado, you know, where a wealthy landowner stepped up and after years of ODOT not having enough funding or, or their uh, CDOT um, not having funding for providing a corridor in a really crucial area where there were significant wildlife mortalities, um, they contributed money uh, to make that project happen. And so just kind of a two part question, uh, one, how the partnership with ODOT is going and if we're in sync and also if in that outreach that you're doing, uh, looking at, you know, having some focus on large landowners that have a strong conservation values. Uh, yeah, our partnership with ODOT is, is always continually growing and evolving. Um, ODOT does struggle with funding wildlife projects. Their funding model is based for our environmental concerns primarily on human health and safety. So they are often only able to contribute funding to a project when wildlife vehicle collisions are directly contributing to human health and safety concerns, which means collision with those large bodied ungulate species, collisions with deer and elk and pronghorn. And unfortunately that negates or neglects some of those connectivity areas with smaller bodied species, hawks and other raptors, foxes, coyote, some of our amphibian and reptile species. So that's something that we need to continue working on in the future is to identify funding sources that ODOT can leverage to be able to address wildlife connectivity concerns and wildlife passage issues for some of those non-ungulate species. During the last legislative session, the Oregon legislature passed House Bill 2834, which is a wildlife corridors bill, which mandates that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife take the information that we develop from OCAMP and write a wildlife corridors action plan and also mandates that the Oregon Department of Transportation take the information in the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan into consideration with their planning projects. So ODOT should have to, in the future, take into consideration the high priority wildlife corridors that our agency develops when they're looking at wildlife mitigation and passage issues. In terms of identifying large private landowners that might be able to contribute funding, I think that's gonna become a concern future and down the line when we have some of these priority corridors highlighted and then we can start to identify individual private landowners who might have land either bordering or uh, within some of these priority corridors that we can reach out to and see if they have an interest in helping us do some wildlife connectivity enhancement, protection, conservation easements, restoration projects, those sorts of things. Thank you. Sean Clements has his hand raised. Uh, yeah, Commissioner uh, Chair Chair Wall, Commissioners. I I just wanted to um, kind of add some perspective on a couple of questions I heard around um, looking at the past and and seeing how far behind we are, etc. And it's certainly the case that in Oregon things look different than they did a hundred years ago, and a lot of our species have been squeezed into areas that they wouldn't normally occupy. Um, but when you think about our strategy and this policy and moving forward, it's really geared towards um, doing the science to address these critical uncertainties, um, doing the science to understand what habitats we have now and what habitats are likely to be resilient in the future, and then really focusing the agency and hopefully the state's efforts in um, protecting and restoring those habitats. 
and making the best uses of the resources we have today and in 10 years to achieve that uplift so that we, you know, whatever plays out, plays out. Um, we're not going back to the past. And so we just need to make the best of what we have right now. And that's what this whole strategy is geared around. Well put, Sean. And um, I spent a lot of years in state agencies and it's always, everybody talks about um, coordinating and consulting and working together with other agencies. Um, what this ODFNW agency has done to make it a reality in this policy and set the groundwork for it is, in my view, quite impressive. So um, your point's well taken, Sean, and um, it's remarkable that we're as far along as we are in figuring out how to work with these other agencies and find the places where we can advance things like vegetation control at the same time we get nutrition and other things. So thank you. Shall we go on to the next and go back to Davia then? Kara, well, that was a grand slam segue. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna, uh, we, we, so we've talked a little bit about these pieces of information that are gonna help us prioritizing habitat protection and restoration um, into uh, using our best available science that um, can determine where we're gonna focus in the future. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is one of the major recommendations of the draft policy that is ODFW should help lead a coordinated long-term uh, statewide response to climate change. The Department of Fish and Wildlife is tasked with managing fish and wildlife, but the actions of many other state agencies and organizations have an impact on the availability of suitable habitat in, within Oregon's lands and waters. Um, we, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, need this coordination and collaboration in ways that maybe other agencies might not. Um, this slide here is uh, all of the logos of the uh, state agencies participating in an update of the statewide climate adaptation framework. And um, the way we've been viewing this is that all of these agencies are linked in some way um, by their role in uh, creating or removing habitat. Uh, the framework will have uh, key recommendations on the need for leadership, data sharing, and building equity into the state's response to climate change. Um, and it will also organize the information in that framework around the six sectors indicated on this slide. And I just wanted to point to um, the natural world chapter is the one that the department is helping to lead, but um, fish and wildlife really do um, depend on all of these other sectors as well as um, uh, how they're impacted by these other sectors. Uh, so we're all linked by habitat. Uh, and I'd like to focus on the recommendation that the framework will make related to leadership. We've discussed how ODFW is identifying high priority habitat for fish and wildlife, but without an overarching plan for the state, each agency, including our department, will go about implementing the priorities that are identified in their own silo. Uh, this can lead to an unbalanced, inefficient, and delayed response to the impacts of climate change. And for a really simplified example of what I mean by that, um, multiple agencies are likely to identify uh, increasing stream temperatures as a, a climate impact that will need to be monitored for the effect on whatever it is that they happen to manage, in our case, cold water fisheries. Um, without shared approaches to addressing those impacts, uh, multiple agencies might purchase new temperature loggers and then go out and place them in the exact same place and we'll be collecting data all in that one place. A coordinated response would result in those three loggers um, being strategically placed in the highest priorities that benefit all agencies and their priorities. So the key question that we need to ask in this process uh, is what is needed to assure the actions of multiple agencies are working towards the same objectives in a given location and that the overall response balances the health of people, fish and wildlife and the economy. Uh, for this hypothetical location in Oregon, um, in yellow, what are the most optimal adaptation actions across all X sectors? And that's going to require all of the agencies to have input, but also some decision making um, and leadership. So the statewide coordination section of the draft climate policy um, points to uh, the need for coordination on the, the four bulleted areas, uh, focusing on shared inventories and vulnerability assessments of the state's assets efficient research and monitoring, and the example I gave you before kind of falls into that category, uh, 
uh, determining clear priorities within and across geographic areas, and the ability to implement those priorities working together. Uh, ODFNW is bringing these concepts to the statewide climate framework discussion. Uh, they are in the policy, and uh, if that policy is adopted, uh, staff will be directed to pursue these, but it, it will take all agencies working together to, to reach that point. Uh, so in this example here, we've got a yellow, a hypothetical yellow area in the state and a hypothetical blue area in the state, and um, that we'd, we'd like to get to a place where um, all of the agencies are working towards similar priorities in those areas. Um, and I take questions on that piece. Bobby, I have one. In our letter to the governor responding to the executive order, we urged that there would be a, um, an executive order having the states coordinate and actually setting up this platform. Has there been any headway on that or is it still in discussion and kind of waiting for some of the COVID stuff to clear? Chair Wall, um, we submitted that report on May 15th um, and our report as well as the reports of the other agencies are all available on the governor's website. Um, but I do think that the, the COVID-19 situation has delayed any decision-making on what's in those reports for now. Thank you. And Commissioner Woolley has his hand raised. Yeah, so my question was related. Oh, let's see, am I? Yes. Okay, you can, okay, you can see me. Um, so my question was related to Commissioner Walls. So I was wondering how much the success of statewide coordination uh, is dependent upon uh, the, this uh, recommended companion executive order that, that we're recommending for the governor. Um, and then also uh, the creation of the position or the, the assignment to facilitate uh, the, the climate action core team. I mean, how important are those two pieces for the success of this initiative. Uh, Commissioner Willie, from my perspective, I think they are important um, and that's why we, we put that in the, the letter to the governor. I think that um, this is not a new idea and, and Chair Wall referenced that before that we've always been talking about coordination within the state agencies. And so that is that will continue on. Um, there are multiple pathways for doing that through existing um, mitigation requirements across agencies uh, for various planning efforts that are happening around renewable energy, um, connectivity, for example. And so those pieces will keep, keep moving forward um, for sure. And so the ideas in our report are really more about accelerating it. Okay. As, as we know, it's great to, to show leadership but if you look over your shoulder and there's nobody with you, then you're not really leading anybody. So, um, you know, these are our key pieces. I think they should be pushed ahead along with, with everything else. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Davia. Should we go on to the, the next one then? Okay. Are you introducing that one too? Um, I'll, I'll help us set this up. Um, so in this whole habitat section here from um, Darren and Anna and Rachel and myself, uh, we've talked about what we know about how habitat is affected by climate change, how that cascades into fish and wildlife population health, and then two examples of how the department is prioritizing habitat across the state, and the critical nature of coordination with other organizations and agencies. You may have noticed that these examples were distinctly fish or wildlife examples. Um, we'd like to conclude this portion of the presentation on habitat with an example that requires strong collaboration internally between the fish and wildlife divisions. Uh, beavers are a species that transcends the boundary of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, and creating more beaver dams is, a frequently, is frequently cited as a potential climate adaptation strategy for fish. Therefore, we wanted to provide some more information about how our staff are working together to determine the best approach. So I'll turn it over to Sean and Derek for that. Thank you. Thanks, Davia. Derek, are you here? I am. There you go. Uh, Chair Wall, uh, Commissioners, so um, there's a lot of interest in beaver at the moment. And, uh, and given that interest, we thought it'd be useful to talk about how we think the policy itself applies to beaver. And give, you know, they're really in a unique spot here. Um, as you can see, there's three ways that we think uh, the policy applies. The first one being to beaver themselves and understanding how they're likely to be impacted to climate change and ensuring the management incorporates the best available science there. 
we're not going to focus on that aspect today. Um, there's going to be a lot of discussion in upcoming weeks and months about beaver. Um, the, another aspect of beaver and how they relate to the climate change is in sequestration of carbon. And again, we're not going to focus a lot on that today, but just briefly, you know, research does show that um, carbon is sequestered behind beaver dams. Um, you know, there's some important caveats there, though, uh, and in particular in relation to Oregon, um, the average lifespan of a beaver dam has a large influence on how much carbon is sequestered. And so in a place like the coast where beaver dams are, are washed out fairly frequently, um, the carbon that's sequestered over that previous year or so is, is released back into the atmosphere. So it is variable across the landscape. The third connection, which we are going to talk about today, and that beavers are really unique in Oregon um, and, and across a lot of the North America, is that beavers also um, manage the habitat for a lot of other species. And they do so in ways that are generally beneficial by building dams. And um, so we're going to focus on that aspect today and just look at how that relates to the climate policy. Next slide. So as we mentioned, um, beavers impact how other, beavers have, at least have the potential to impact how other species will be impacted by climate change. And they do that by potentially increasing the resilience of habitat and or providing refugia. And these beneficial impacts are often cited by proponents of beaver restoration. And while it's true that beaver dams generally have beneficial impacts, it's really important to manage the expectations here. Um, history and science tells us there's no silver bullet when it comes to this kind of issue. And so when we think about the climate policy and some of the things we need to keep in mind when considering beavers as, a, as an adaptation strategy. Um, and so Derek's kind of kind of run through a couple of things uh, around beavers, et cetera, in the next slide. So yes, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me just fine for the record. Chair Wall, member of the commission, uh, Derek Roman, I am the carnivore fur bear coordinator. Um, and Sean did a good job of getting us started here by um, uh, mentioning about the value of beaver, but let me just continue to reiterate that beaver are a keystone species based on their ability to modify different environments. This not only benefits themselves, but other many other species, such as uh, dozens of Oregon conservation strategy species. Um, some of the benefits by the beaver activity can be short term, but some such as changes to forested and open wetlands may take many, many, many years. So um, that's one aspect of trying to manage some of our expectations. Um, otherwise, regarding the habitat modification, there's really no direct relationship between the number of beaver, the number of dams, dam longevity, and especially any long-term impacts. Um, first off, when we're talking about these habitat modifications by beaver, it's important that we are recognizing that this really only applies to smaller stream reaches. We're not talking about beavers building dams across the Columbia River, although beaver are quite abundant in the Columbia River. Um, so while beaver can occupy all of these reaches, it's important that we focus in on where those habitat changes may be occurring. Now, just looking at recent Oregon-based research data, uh, some stream survey information provided by the U.S. Forest Service documented that about 70% of the beaver sign that they documented did not include beaver dams. Similarly, research on the Oregon coast in the Umpqua Basin saw that 80% of the time they were finding beaver sign but no beaver dams. So um, again, there's just not that clear connection. Also, as Sean alluded to, research in Oregon has demonstrated that 90% of coastal dams blow out on an annual basis. So we're oftentimes missing that longevity in certain locations. Other parts of the state where there's the water levels are far less variable uh, have a higher probability of persistence over the years. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, also, location dictates the value and use of dams for habitat and for mitigating climate change. Um, this really kind of touches on one of these overall messages here today of prioritizing areas, and uh, it is important to recognize some of these limitations. Uh, for example, some dam locations may have negative impacts and potentially serve as ecological traps, meaning that these are areas that uh, fish or wildlife might seek out, but ultimately it turns out to be a bad decision. Um, Oregon has documented the spread actually of, of invasive species such as reed canary grass by beaver damming activities as well. Uh, on a very anecdotal um, 
perspective, just the dam in front of ODFW headquarters here in Salem impounds water in the dry summer months that normally would have dried out. Uh, it produces really warm, stagnant water and actually supports quite an impressive breeding population of bullfrogs. Um, so certainly to evaluate and ensure that this tool will be effective requires a coordinated effort and various professional backgrounds. Um, so while I covered a bit of the wildlife aspect of things, I think it's now appropriate to turn it back to Sean so he can provide a, an aquatic perspective. Thanks, Derek. So when we think about uh, the impact that beaver dams have on fish, um, a lot of times uh, the impact of beaver, beneficial impact of beaver dams is cited as having um, benefits for summer low flows and, and lowering stream temperatures. And that's certainly the case in a number of locations. Um, but we also know through the science that there are other locations where that's not the case. Um, and there are Derek talked about ecological traps. There are places um, across Oregon where we see increases in stream temperature and anoxic conditions, particularly at night, um, associated with beaver dams. And so we, um, we really need to understand that the impact of beaver dams is really contextual across the landscape. And it feeds back into that idea of understanding where and when they're likely to be beneficial um, as a management strategy and overlaying that with what we talked about earlier about prioritizing. Um, the other piece that Derek talked about is uh, invasive species, and it's similar on the fish side where beaver dams in some locations, in some circumstances under climate change may be um, a place where, um, where invasive species could spread from because they harbor conditions behind that are conducive to the spread of uh, warm water fish. Again, that's not going to be the case across the landscape, but these are just things that we need to consider that this is not a one size fits all approach and um, this kind of uncertainty needs to be addressed. The next slide. And so that's where really, um, when you think about how um, climate change in beaver and the application of the policy, in this regard, beaver assisted habitat restoration may be one of the management strategies to increase resilience. But when you think about um, the key principles, uh, there's the key science principle around reducing the uncertainties, and then um, the habitat principles around applying that, that strategy in priority locations. And that's really where the nexus to the policy is. And a lot of this is around reducing some of those uncertainties. And there's a lot of science going on now to understand where beavers can be most beneficial, where they might have adverse impacts, and then understanding what management changes we might recommend around um, riparian management to encourage the beavers that are there already to build more dams in cases where that's going to be beneficial. So there, there is some uncertainty. The, uh, the impacts across the landscape are not um, one size fits all. And that's really how we view this through the policy lens. Derek, do you want to say any more about that? Good, thank you. So I think um, we're kind of done with that section if you want to if you have any questions. Any questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Woolley has his hand raised. Go ahead, Commissioner Woolley. Okay, thanks. So my experience in invasive vegetation management, uh, flooding has been used as a tool to control reed canary grass. So could you explain how the reverse happens? In other words, Derek, you're saying that uh, flooding has, or flooding behind beaver dam has enhanced reed canary grass. And so my experience is it's just the opposite. If you can flood for a couple of years, you, you can actually kill it. So I don't know. I mean, do you, do you know anything more about that? Yes, uh, Chairwell Commissioner Woolley, um, the publication was done by Oregon State researchers and I would be, I'm gonna be careful to not try and describe their research um, without being obviously involved. But one of the take homes were that the flood events were variable. It wasn't that a dam was built and that water level remained high. It was because there was so much variability that invasive species and as invasive species do, was able to take advantage of that fluctuation, that variability in that uh, amount of moisture and in those, those habitats. So um, that was really the take home that yes, in, in many cases, a lot of uh, aquatic vegetation 
uh, cat tells others uh, do benefit by long-term drowning. But in this case, they're talking about this, this variability of um, uh, water levels. Okay, so you're talking about one, one study, essentially not, not the general consensus that flooding kills reed canary grass. So you're talking about a study that was done. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Greg? No. Sean, I have a question about how this kind of coordination and the connections are made within the department. And what I'm thinking of is tomorrow we're going to hear, we're going to consider a temporary rule for angling sanctuaries in the Columbia River. And the EPA leading up to the, the sanctuaries, um, EPA looked at the, the Columbia and said, we have enough right now of cold water areas to for the steelhead to maybe work their way up the river, but it's dependent on those staying cold. And that means we got to keep the habitat in good shape above them. How would that fit? And I like that, that you're talking about across fish and wildlife. And this one is how the different parts of the agency, how this policy will help make those kind of connections. Chair, uh, well, yeah, that's a great question. So I think here what we're looking at is um, you're talking about beaver dams as a strategy in the Columbia Basin to um, lower temperatures and, and achieve some stream flow benefits that then trickle out into the Columbia um, and, and help with those refugia. Is that accurate? Not, well, that's probably a better question than I did ask, but all I was asking is, um, as I understood it, we have the sanctuaries that the three cold water areas we have identified and we are, are calling those sanctuaries for the, especially for steelhead. But in order for those to stay cold, we have to protect the habitat above them. And that's a different part of the agency than, than the people who are doing the, the cold water areas. So those are important connections to make because in order for those sanctuaries to do their job, we have to protect the habit, the habitat above them. And so is this policy, it seems like one of its functions is gonna to be to make those kind of connections within the agency. Exactly, and I think um, what you're gonna see when uh, Tom Stoll talks later is this really comes together in the planning process when we're planning for conservation and management of these species. And you know, we look at the management, habitat management strategies that are gonna be necessary to uh, maintain their persistence in conservation. And within those habitat strategies, again, we're gonna be looking back to these overlays that Anna and, and Rachel have talked about in terms of identifying where the priorities are and then what are the limiting factors and how do we address those? And in this case, you know, cold water is, is gonna be one of those limiting factors across the state. And so what is our strategy to manage for that? In a lot of cases, you know, it might, we might look at land management, we might look at flow restoration, etc. Thank you. That's great. Um, so shall we then move on to the next section? And Sean, are you the moderator for that? Or did I? Yeah. I was that we're, we're about halfway if you wanted to have a break. Just throw that out there. Commissioners, would you like a break or keep going? Thumbs up for a break. 10 minutes. So we'll take a 10 minute break, thank you. <laughs> 
So our, our 10 minutes are up. Are people back and ready to, Sean, are you ready to start again? Yeah. Good. Could I just make one comment to both Sean and, and Davia? And that is that though the, the forum is a little awkward and these Zoom things always are, this is an incredibly um, rich and useful uh, presentation or series of presentations. Um, so it's terrific to be able to get this. So go ahead with the second half. Cheers and thanks for that. Uh, where are we? Okay, Chair Wall Commissioners, welcome back. Um, we've spent you know an hour and a half or so here talking about habitat and the critical need here to, to focus, coordinate and double down. And hopefully um, you have a better sense now in looking at the words on in the policy and and our, um, how that trans translates into action on the ground in terms of our strategy going forward. Um, we're gonna spend the last half of the presentation talking about resource management um, and so which is the critters themselves and how we bring a climate overlay to our management here. And the context for the, all this work obviously is our mission, which is protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment of present and future generations. Um, it's a mission that you know, all folks in the agency identify deeply with um, and it's something that we're working towards. Next slide. So when we think about climate change and some of the projections and implications for fish and wildlife, it's easy to be overwhelmed and kind of you have that siege mentality where we want to close up shop and, and save everything. Um, you know, the, the future in, in some locations looks bleak. Um, but when we do that, it has implications for both, of our, um, for both aspects of our mission. And that's because engagement is a really critical conservation tool uh, we need to keep people engaged so that they care about these resources and advocate for them. And if we lose that connection, it's going to make the battle to conserve species all the more difficult. Next slide. And so um, Davia set this up earlier, but what we really need to think about here in terms of how climate change is going to impact uh, fish and wildlife is, is in managing that risk. Um, there is risk on the long scale, 20, 30, 50, 100 years out. How do we manage that in the near term so we give ourselves the best chance 20, 30, 50 years out um, that these populations will still be in a good place? Um, and that's we do that by scaling the use of these um, resources appropriately to avoid negative impacts on long-term conservation. Next. And that concept's really reflected in, in the first key principle under um, resource management and habitat which acknowledges that job number one here is the conservation of naturally produced native species in the, in the areas that they're indigenous. Um, but recognizing that also that, that strong conservation base is the platform on which we can allow um, use and enjoyment and continue to foster that engagement. So the next few slides, we're just gonna um, kind of run through what it was actually mean to scale risk here um, when you're thinking about harvest. Uh, next slide. And these are just kind of generalized graphs, hypothetical scenarios. Um, so here we've got a theoretical population that's fluctuating through time. And you might think of this as abundance through time. This is typical of, of all animals and has been true through time that we see these fluctuations. And the reason populations fluctuate varies, um, but you know, often relates to changes in, in habitat carrying capacity. Um, one of the you know, large overlays we have here in the Pacific Northwest is these El Nino cycles of El Nino, La Nina. We see populations cycle through that because of changes in, um, in precipitation and temperatures on land and then changes in, in uh, ocean currents and ocean temperatures. Next slide. And so, you know, at a real basic level, what it means to scale harvest is that when you have those good years um, and you have high numbers of um, of adults in your population, uh, you can allow more harvest. And then in those poor years where uh, adult numbers are down, uh, you scale back and you might allow no harvest. And in between there, there's a gradation. Next. Actually, can we go back? I had a few other points to make on that. Cheers. Um, so this graph obviously applies differently to different species. And so if you think of a, a short-lived species like salmon or steelhead, um, where they have density dependent mortality and fresh water, um, in cases where we have high returns, we might have more adults than we need to seed that habitat. 
And so we can safely harvest um, the animals that are above that, uh, where we start to see that density dependent mortality without impacting the overall productivity of the population. Um, if we think about this graph in terms of a, a mammal, for example, uh, we might consider that at high abundances, um, reproductions suppressed. And so that when we harvest a few of those animals uh, and reduce that abundance, you get a compensatory increase in reproduction recruitment. Um, the overall take home here is, a, is that population scale through, uh, population cycle through time, and we can scale harvest accordingly based on various measures of population health. So now onto the next slide. And under climate change, we expect that there'll continue to be these cyclical patterns of good and bad conditions. Um, the other thing that's true is that the future is not set in stone. Um, there are multiple potential pathways along the future. We don't know what large scale global policies are gonna be enacted. Uh, we don't necessarily know um, what technological changes are gonna occur, what social changes are gonna occur. And, um, and you know, we're getting a better hand handle on how species may adapt and their adaptive capacity, but we don't necessarily know everything yet. And so there are multiple pathways. Um, and so our response has to reflect that. Uh, next slide. And so I just wanna go back and put another plug in for habitat is that you know one of the ways we can influence that future is by focusing on the habitat and giving these species the best chance to prevent declines in carrying capacity and allow behavioral adaptation. So it's one, uh, one plug back towards habitat for how we can change the future um, and hopefully end up in a better place. Next slide. But then um, we also need to recognize that despite our best efforts, um, you know, in some places it is gonna be really challenging uh, and that over time we may see this general downward trajectory in um, populations in some locations. Uh, even within that though, you, you look and see we're gonna have those cycles are gonna continue. There'll still be good years, there'll still be some bad years, but the trend overall is downwards. And so next slide. When you think about managing harvest uh, uh, under those scenarios, a framework that you set up today to account for good years and bad years is still relevant in the future. Um, the difference is that in, in future years, you're gonna be spending more time down in the gray area where you're not harvesting or harvesting very low numbers. Um, and that's under the same framework as today. We assume that those frameworks will adapt and evolve over time as we understand more, but the basic concept is that you set things up to account for any threats, any changes in populations, and you manage accordingly based on the information you have. Next slide. And then there are other additional things we can do, such as building in buffers. Um, and, and here you, you have to think about the species that you're managing. For example, long-lived species, um, there are, there are opportunities to, um, to bank some of these critters as a hedge against future declines. For short-lived species, such as salmon steelhead, um, a lot of our minnows, you can't bank those species for the future. Um, you just have to make sure that there's enough critters getting through to spawn in any given year that they can continue the population. Um, the other thing here is to avoid targeting certain life histories um, and protect the vulnerable life histories. Um, we don't know necessarily you know, who the genetic winners and losers are gonna be in the future. And so we wanna make sure that we give these populations the best chance by preserving the full range of um, genetic diversity that's there right now. And so our harvest um, management takes that into account. And so we're gonna go through a few presentations coming up here, um, I think three that are gonna talk about some of the ways that we're working these concepts in already, and we'll continue to do so um, through our planning processes in the future. Um, next slide. The other piece, um, if you look in our policy, we have a key principle ar around responding adaptively. And, that, and that's when we think about really um, in, in a given year, um, what conditions are we seeing and how do we respond to that? Um, and that's where if annual population estimates come in lower than projected, or if we have these really adverse environmental conditions, high temperatures, um, we will adjust course within that year and say um, either we need to constrain harvest more or um, things are coming in better than expected and there's more opportunity allowed. So we respond adaptively. And I think there's been a number of instances of that across the past few years um, where we put in place systems to respond. Um, and I think you're gonna see some of that in the presentations coming up. 
So first up, we are going to talk, um, or actually, was there any questions about that before we dive into some of these case studies? Hearing none. Um, I think next up we have Michael Klein, who's the Upland Game Bird Coordinator. She's going to talk about sage grouse. Um, and take it away, Michael. Of course, my phone would ring right at that moment, huh? Uh, good afternoon, Chair Wall, members of the Commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Klein, Upland Game Bird Coordinator. Uh, I'm going to be presenting sage grouse as a case study in a species that is adaptively managed to accommodate both conservation and utilization. Uh, I hope to draw parallels between management and the key science and management principles of the proposed policy. Uh, in particular, I'll touch on how we use collaboration, research, and monitoring to adaptively manage risks to sage grouse. To set the stage, um, Oregon still has very large expanses of intact sage grouse habitat and is considered part of two remaining strongholds range wide, but that habitat is under threat from climate change. Um, in simple terms, we understand that sage grouse are experiencing habitat degradation from low and high elevation, squeezing them into the remaining suitable habitat. At low elevations, the fire cheatgrass cycle is eliminating sagebrush and perennial ground cover necessary for protection and forage. And at high levels, at high elevations, uh, western juniper is expanding due to 100 years of fire suppression and also likely benefiting from higher carbon dioxide levels in the air. Uh, as a reminder, the first key science principle in the proposed policy states that the department should ensure that it is monitoring the appropriate metrics to document the changing climate conditions and the impacts of those changes on fish, wildlife, and their habitats. Uh, so a, a note on that in, in the sage grouse context, um, because BLM hosts the majority of sage grouse in Oregon, in addition to private landowners, um, the BLM takes the lead on monitoring the status of sage grouse habitats, whereas the department takes the lead on monitoring populations. An example of how habitat change is assessed uh, is the annual evaluation of capable habitat acres versus current habitat acres within sage grouse packs or priority, priority areas for conservation. There are, are adaptive management triggers associated with this evaluation. And so when packs reach less than 65% um, of current habitat as compared to um, potential habitat, capable habitat, uh, that trips uh, what we call a soft trigger resulting in vegeta vegetation treatments to bring the ratios above that threshold. Um, and so as an example, since 2012, the BLM has completed about 230,000 acres of vegetation treatments within six sage grouse packs, uh, primarily being juniper removal and treatment of invasive annual grasses. Next slide, please. Just a quick word on collaboration um, as, as it states in the policy. Uh, the department should collaborate and partner with other agencies, tribes, stakeholders, and academics to achieve successful implementation of this policy. Uh, and Oregon has, um, has worked with numerous partners um, over 10 years to scale up management actions to address sage grouse threats, including, and this is definitely not an exhaustive list, targeted juniper removal, fire suppression, invasive um, annual grass treatments, fence marking, conservation easements on private land, riparian restoration, and uh, mitigation for development of sage grouse habitat. These logos represent a fraction of the organizations involved in sage grouse conservation in Oregon and beyond. From land management to science to population monitoring, each organization has a unique role. Because of these efforts, managers have a solid context to ensure that sage grouse can persist um, one of the highlights of that is actually a science framework um, that was um, driven by the Forest Service uh, specific to climate change scenarios that predict changes in temperature and precipitation across sage grouse range through the year 2100. And we also understand that championing sage grouse will benefit a suite of sage dependent species throughout the Great Basin. Next slide, please. 
the second and third key science principles are related to research and how um, we should use appropriate analytical approaches to determine um, how these species and habitats may respond to climate change. Um, and we should be conducting ongoing research to reduce key uncertainties. Um, currently, the department contributes funding to numerous research projects on sage grouse and sagebrush, uh, primarily in cooperation with Oregon State University. We've looked at post fire effects, um, predator interactions, uh, conifer removal, uh, frankly, investing the majority of the upland game bird budget in research and coordination of sage grouse. Uh, one example that I'm uh, presenting here uh, had a remarkable finding in the Warner Mountains of Oregon, looking at 32,000 acres of conifer removal on pu both public and private lands. And researchers found a 12% increase in sage grouse population growth uh, rates following large scale juniper removal uh, when compared to an untreated control landscape. For a long lived bird like the sage grouse, that is a tremendous difference and indicates that conifer removal can functionally increase sage grouse populations. Um, I will also mention that the Warner unit is one of the sage grouse units open to controlled hunting, which brings me to the topic of utilization. Next slide, please. Um, the key species and habitat management principles of the policy we're looking at today focus on adaptive management. Uh, it states that the ability to utilize fish and wildlife for harvest or viewing is dependent on the health of the wild populations. Conservation and use are not mutually exclusive and can be fully integrated through risk management that scales use appropriately to avoid undermining conservation. So to be begin this discussion, I constructed a simple graph to demonstrate how we can utilize harvest responsibly in the management of species without impacting populations outside their natural mortality. And this concept has been studied extensively in sage grouse, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> so the black line that you see here represents um, annual survival under different harvest scenarios. So on the bottom, you can see um, uh, potential harvest rates of a species. And of course, when you get to 100% harvest, then you're out of, um, you're out of critters. And so <laughs> sage grouse have a, they actually have a fairly consistent annual survival rate, uh, usually between 50 and 60%. Uh, that, that is not affected by low harvest rates. Um, you may have heard the phrase, you can't stockpile birds. In other words, the harvested birds would have died by other means during the year. This concept is known as compensatory mortality and is the foundation of harvest management of wildlife. Um, so how can harvest be absorbed within natural mortality rates? The short answer in this case is, is density dependence. As birds are removed from the population, the probability of survival increases for the remaining birds due to decreased chances of predation, uh, decreased disease transmission, better and safer roosting and nesting sites, and better food resources distributed among fewer individuals. Based on the best available science, harvest rates of 10% or less to the left of the red line do not have a significant influence on the subsequent year's breeding population. Oregon is able to keep harvest between three and 5%, the green line, by annually adjusting the number of tags based on the results of the spring population estimate. There are essentially seven levers that we can pull to adaptively manage the annual sage grouse harvest allocation. Uh, limiting the number of hunters through a controlled hunt process, offering no season where populations are small or isolated, limiting harvest to no more than two birds per season per hunter, uh, limiting the number of permits available to, to take no more than that 5%, um, holding the season early um, to allow more time for compensatory effects versus additive effects. Um, the, later, the later you hunt, the more likely that mortality would be additive. Um, uh, six, concluding the season um, by September 20th to maximize the biological information we achieved through wing collection. And finally, um, uh, annually modifying the permit numbers or closed areas to hunting as needed. So that's a long list, but there are lots of things that we can do to make sure we stay within that, um, that green line. Uh, I'll do the, the last slide, please. So monitoring is a key piece to adaptive management, as we know, um, and the department does take the lead role in coordinating monitoring and publishing the annual population report. 
which drives management decisions on the ground, including BLM adaptive um, management population triggers and tag allocation for the controlled hunt. Each spring, the department and all those cooperating agencies that we talked about, plus a bunch of volunteers, monitor uh, between 50 and 70% of LECs and LEC complexes in each of the 20 packs. This is frankly a monumental undertaking and it, pro it provides information on the number of males in the spring population. Uh, however, female and production estimates are necessary for the annual population model. Hunter harvested wings provide the remaining piece of the puzzle. Uh, that includes sex ratios, age ratios, and even nest success and peak hatch date can be determined from those wings. And what we have learned through all of this intensive monitoring, uh, just like Sean said, is that sage grouse, um, like all species, have good years and bad years related to weather and habitat in addition to their natural population cycles. We can't stockpile birds above the carrying capacity of the landscape. Therefore, maintaining and improving quality habitat is the key to ensuring viable populations in the long term. I will conclude my remarks there. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioners, are there questions of Michael? Just looking to see. Um, Commissioner Woolley, it looks like your hand is up. Yeah, it actually goes back to Sean. Um, and so Sean, you were talking about, you know, our model, our policy of adjusting harvest levels based on, on fluctuating uh, populations. And the plan talks a lot about planning for the future and planning for density independent factors like fire and drought, you know, and things that that we don't necessarily have control over. Um, and so, and we also, you know, in this management, in these management schemes, we talk about, you know, having a buffer. So how is climate change being factored into this future planning uh, regarding harvest levels based on density independent factors that we can't anticipate? You know, we're, we're trying to, plan for a lot of things that are unknown and that's challenging. And so I, I just wondering kind of what, what your thoughts are on that. I mean, have, what, what sort of strategies are you developing? Uh, Commissioner Woolley, uh, Chair Wall, I think you're referring to planning in general, not specifically to sage grass, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking um, about more, more general. Yeah, so a couple of things here, and others might jump in, other RDFW folks might jump in if needed. Um, when we think about planning, we go through and look at, at what are the factors that are likely to limit production or productivity um, over the long run, and what are the projections for species over, for species over the long run. Um, and you know, when you think about climate change, you're looking at um, what how is climate change going to impact those things that already limit those species? So for example, um, I'll just use the fish example because I'm familiar. We know that fish are limited by temperature and flow and land, and we know that they're limited by ocean survival um, if they're anadromous, for example, or marine. And so um, climate change, we have some idea of what the trajectories are there on those things. Um, and but, but also, through, also through these mapping exercises, we know where some of the areas that are resilient are likely to be. Um, and so we can through our various management strategies centered around habitat, we focus our efforts through the planning process in those areas that are gonna um, expand the resilient areas that, that these populations have access to, to give them the best chance down the line. Um, and again, when you think about populations 20, 30, 50 years out, it's those habitat actions that largely are gonna dictate what state the habitat's in by the time they get there and that ability of the habitat to, to sustain those populations. In the near term, um, you know, the levers we have to pull are around harvest and on the fish side hatcheries. And what we need to do with those is make sure that um, depending on the species, uh, you know, it goes back to the life history and short lived, long lived. Um, what do you need to make sure it gets through to the next generation um, to make sure that you're preserving the genetic diversity, preserving all the pieces so that down the line, um, there's enough diversity there to take advantage of whatever habitat you've got at that point in time. So the strategies are around long-term habitat, near-term harvest and hatchery management. 
Okay, so I, I'm i following, I'm thinking about, uh, for instance, uh, carnivores, large carnivores, uh, and how climate change, and of course, it, part of that's dependent on their the habitat that's available for their prey species. Um, but, but those are kind of more of the animals that I was thinking. I think fish, it's a little bit easier to think through it. But um, I, I just was wondering if you had any thoughts on on some of our, our animal species. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about condivores, to be honest, unless I'm in the forest. Uh, um, so I might turn that over to Derek and see if he has any thoughts. Sure. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, um, as a lot of our large carnivores go, uh, they're very much dependent upon their prey. So like we heard from Dr. Darren Clark earlier today, knowing more about those prey populations and focusing in on them, oftentimes the predators will follow and respond. Fortunately, we don't have any uh, obligate species where any carnivores that are very, very tightly tied to one prey species. Uh, fortunately with cougars, especially, they'll take anything from um, skunks and very small mammals all the way up to, to deer and elk. But certainly um, some things that I keep in mind are some of their, their hunting styles or hunting strategies. If there's a lock, loss of cover, perhaps, um, that can greatly impact some of our ambush predators. Uh, or some of those species that um, in good habitat conditions, especially the relationship between carnivores, there's a resource allocation where uh, say wolves are in one area, cougars in another area, bears in another area. If we were to lose some of that diversity on the landscape, I feel like that could put them in closer contact, uh, have greater competition for resources. But again, too, fortunately, the extra effort and emphasis on our uh, ungulate populations should help sound the alarm first. Um, and then ideally those, um, if we can address the prey, that the carnivores will be okay. Thank you. Um, Greg, did you have another follow-up or we'll go on to Commissioner Labhart and then Commissioner Spellbrink? Yeah, we can continue, Sherwell. Commissioner Labhart. Okay, thank you. Mike, a great presentation, very informative. My question relates to um, the work that Oregon has done is the Yeoman's work, the collaboration, how do we compare to other states that have significant sage grouse uh, populations? Uh, yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, um, I think it's fair to say that Oregon is leading the way when it comes to setting the example for collaboration uh, and, and action on the ground when it comes to sage grouse. We're, we're doing a good job. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that the, the work is done or we're even anywhere close to, um, to achieving what needs to happen uh, as far as things like juniper removal and figuring out how to control cheatgrass um, on the ground. Um, I, uh, one bright spot is that we've done a, the last few years, um, we've done a really good job of putting out fires in, in prime sage grouse habitat. We haven't had a large scale fire, fingers crossed, um, uh, since um, well, it's been a, it's been a uh, half a dozen years now. So that's, that's good news. And that's because of our, our uh, rural fire protection um, departments. So they're doing a good job. So uh, finding the resolution to cheat grass is probably like reinventing the wheel. <laughs> so when you figure that out, let us all know. I have the cheat grasses. Yeah, it's a big issue. Thank you for sure. your information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Spellbrink. Unmute yourself. Yeah, if you you're exactly. That's right. I was looking for the. I was looking for the icon. Uh, yeah, good presentations, like all of them here, uh, Michael. Uh, I had a question on the, uh, you know, the juniper removal. How that benefited the sage grouse? What exactly is the effect of the removal of the juniper? Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Spellbrink, um, really good question. Uh, sage grouse do not want to be anywhere near a juniper cover that's more than four percent of the landscape. Uh, that's part of the research that uh, that we found, and and that's because um, juniper provide raptor perches, and that is a primary predator for sage grouse. So, um, and that's also why we're worried about things like cell towers and and um, transmission towers, um, because those provide 
um, perches for things like ravens and hawks and um, sage grouse don't want anything to do with that on the on the landscape. Um, the other thing is that is that juniper is really hard on the understory. Uh, it uh, it uh, it's really hard on the perennial grasses and the forbs um, underneath and and oftentimes if your if your juniper stand is too old. Uh, when you remove it, the only thing that comes back is cheat grass. And so um, getting to those juniper stands early um, and then maintaining those, uh, the cut is important. But uh, we're, we're down to kind of a, a lot of mechanical thinning because um, our sagebrush is not recovering from, from fire very quickly at, um, right now. So um, I, I don't expect that, that to change. But mechanical treatment is slow when it comes to juniper treatments. And is juniper, is it historically more abundant than it, it was uh, in the past? Uh, it just seems like I've heard uh, people complain about juniper, uh, how much water they take out of the ground and different. And I wonder if it, uh, some of this, uh, you know, juniper removal wouldn't be beneficial for a lot of other species too, we're talking about, you know. Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Spellbrink, uh, Western juniper and, and um, there are other different kinds of juniper out there throughout the Great Basin, but ours is Western, um, has, has spread um, drastically across our, our Eastern range of our sage grouse. And um, the reason for that was, you know, initially probably fire suppression. Um, juniper is really susceptible to fire. Um, and so for a hundred years, we've been putting out fires and, um, and giving them a foothold. Um, there's, there's also some thought that, that um, as trees, they're really benefiting from the, the excess carbon dioxide in the air. And, um, and one thing about, about juniper is that because it's keeping the perennial grasses from trapping carbon dioxide under the ground, when juniper does burn, um, it's releasing all of that carbon dioxide into the air. And that doesn't happen when you have um, perennial grasses as your, um, as your main vegetation. Thanks. Thanks for that response. Thank you, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Thank you. Uh, oh, wait, I'm going to try my video too. Whoops. There we go. I like to turn it off because I'm always itching my face, you know, picking my nose. It's embarrassing, right? On live video all over. <laughs> um, my, I just, um, Michael, I'm so thankful for your presentation and it, 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 of course, Juniper Country is where I'm from, so it's near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, I was wondering if um, you guys are, you know, if the organ habitat connectivity process, if the sage grouse are one of the overlay species that's in that um, uh, uh, the layers that Rachel was talking about this morning. Yeah, Chair Wall, uh, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, thank you for that. Um, I, it looks like Rachel has taken her microphone um, uh, off of mute, so I'm going to let her answer this one. Okay. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, maybe maybe not. Um, <laughs> we I might have to get back to you on that one. I'm okay. I'm not sure what um, what we've accomplished on that front as far as sage grouse connectivity. Um, I think what we what we do know is that the best of the best habitat is truly the higher elevation habitats, and that's you know as as climate change proceeds, um, we expect that we probably are going to lose some of the lower elevation um, habitats, and and if we have to um, if we have to choose, it's the higher elevation um, habitats that have the better soils and and more potential, um, and that's of course where the juniper is. Okay, so the, my follow up with that, though, is that one of the things that I'm really concerned about is that, um, you, you know, even for grouse, that loss of connectivity. It's surprising to me, uh, just last week driving um, again, you know, east of Bend, and boy, the, the population wave is coming out to the desert. Um, and so I just was curious if that that was you know, being thought about um, in terms of grouse. But then my other um, just general comment that I wanted to say is that I'm so thankful for um, 
the approach that Oregon as a whole is taking on grouse. And I, it really warms my heart for you to also mention these rural fire um, setups that are going on. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a volunteer. I, I, I'm terrible. I actually like to start fires, which is bad. <laughs> but um, but uh, we have so many um, uh, neat volunteers in these communities. And I like to see how all of these things, you know, sort of are connecting for us to be successful. And um, so that's my, I'll go back on mute. <laughs> And Chair, while Rachel Wheat has her hand raised. Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, Chair, while my apologies, I had my phone on mute as well, so I had double muted myself. Um, I just wanted to chime in and say that, yes, greater sage grouse are one of the OCAM species, so we will be doing the complete connectivity assessment and mapping for them. Great. Thank you for that. I have one question back to you, Sean, and that is, you mentioned, um, I think a couple times that we influence the future and maybe buffer ourselves a bit from whatever might be impacts that could happen by focusing on habitat. And a lot of the discussion today has been about better um, management information, better um, coordination if we can find it. Is there something else you're thinking of when you say we can influence it by focusing on habitat? And I, I guess I would ask that question in the frame of, as opposed to what? Uh, uh, Chair Wall, commissioners, um, I, I don't think there's anything else here that you're missing. It's, it's okay. more like making the best use of what we have um, by focusing in these areas rather than, you know, I think Anna referred to it a couple of times, the postage stamp approach or the random acts of conservation. And, and you know, we've been moving in this direction for a while, mm -hmm. um, you know, with an IDFW and, and coordinating with other, other agencies and groups, um, but we really need to do more in this regard. And, and I think we're proposing a, a, a path forward to do that. Um, it's not gonna be easy for sure, but I think you know, when you think not just of fish and wildlife, but of all the other sectors here in Oregon um, that are feeling the impacts and are going to feel more impacts, we need to be working together and all rowing in the same direction so that all of us come out of the end of, um, or in the middle of this in a good place. Um, and so that's the message we're sending. Um, we're going to do our best to, to you know, make that happen. Um, we are reliant on others to a large extent. And so yeah, we'll do what we can internally and we'll do what we can externally. Great, thank you. That pulls it together. Thank you, that's great. Could you go ahead and introduce the next one then? Sure, yeah. So um, we have about what, 37 minutes left. We've got um, three more presentations, two on fish and then a planning one. So um, next up, we're gonna have Maggie Summer, who's our uh, marine fisheries section manager. She's going to talk about some of the marine fisheries um, and the nexus of the climate policy to the management of those fisheries. Thank you. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Sean. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thanks again. My name is Maggie Summer. I am our marine fisheries uh, management lead in the ODFW's marine program uh, based in Newport. Um, you know, but, we, ODFW manages fisheries for over 100 marine and estuarine species through your decisions and state rule and through our voting seat on the Pacific Fishery Management Council for federally managed stocks. Uh, and our goal is to ensure conservation of marine resources and to provide for sustainable recreational and commercial fishing opportunities in line with our, our agency's mission. Uh, before we dive into the few marine slides I have here, uh, I just want to note that we focused attention on climate change in marine systems for years. Uh, a few examples uh, include the addition of climate change to the nearshore strategy as a key issue in 2012. Um, and the Pacific Fishery Management Council is actively working on initiatives related to climate change under its fishery ecosystem plan and a number of state and federal marine fishery management plans explicitly address climate change and include adaptive management provisions. So next slide, please, and we'll go on to uh, some discussion on those. Thanks. Uh, so we want to see fish stocks and fisheries that are resilient and robust to change. Uh, 
A keystone uh, of our approach is understanding how changing ocean conditions are affecting marine species, ecosystems, and fishing opportunities, and what the risks are to their persistence and health over the long term. We work closely with partners from our neighboring coastal states, federal agencies, academic institutions such as Oregon State University, the fishing industry, and NGOs, and we do a lot of data collection and modeling to add to our collective understanding of climate change impacts. The research being conducted at Oregon's marine reserve sites, uh, or that could be done at these sites in the future, is a great example of science that can help paint that picture. Even so, there's a lot we don't know. While future ocean conditions and ecosystem dynamics are uncertain, we know that changes will occur, and we know that overall variability is likely to increase. We know that uh, changing conditions affect different fish species and shellfish species in different ways. So we build multiple buffers into fishery management frameworks to account for risk and uncertainty, and I'll talk uh, about that more in a moment. When we do have specific knowledge of how environmental factors affect marine species, some examples of how we use it are estimating productivity of a stock and the sustainable catch levels under different environmental conditions, or to trigger a certain management response when conditions don't support productive and abundant fish stocks. Finally, we wanna ensure that we're adapting and responding to changes on an appropriate time frame. We don't want to just use a set it and forget it approach. So our science and regulatory processes have to stay current. The next three slides highlight several examples of considering climate change in managing marine fisheries. So let's go on to the next one, please. Thanks. This slide illustrates uh, the reference points and multiple buffers that are built into the process of determining catch limits in federal fishery management under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which has guided federal fisheries since 1976 and mandates preventing overfishing and achieving optimum yield. Uh, stock assessments are estimates of population size, structure, and productivity, and they project harvest levels that maximize the number of fish that can be caught every year while leaving enough in the ocean to maintain a healthy stock, or if you will, leaving the capital in the bank and only withdrawing the interest. They're also, uh, the, the um, harvest levels also in, um, uh, are, are set to ensure protection of the marine ecosystems. Assessments give us the overfishing limit or OFL for each stock as one of their key outputs. This is the catch level that corresponds to maximum sustainable yield, which is an estimate of the largest long-term average catch that can be taken under prevailing ecological environmental conditions. Catch above the overfishing limit could jeopardize the stock's capacity to continue producing maximum sustainable yield over the long-term if it occurred on a chronic basis. While I'm not presenting details on stock assessment models or data sources today, uh, I do want to note that they incorporate uh, species life histories and many environmental factors and are um, uh, responsive to climate change in that way. Uh, but I really want to focus on the buffers here, and there is a required buffer below the overfishing limit to account for several types of uncertainty and risk tolerance. Each regional fishery management council has a scientific and statistical committee that recommends the annual, pardon, the annual acceptable biological catch for each stock at a level below the overfishing limit. This buffer accounts for uh, multiple types of scientific uncertainty in the assessment data inputs and modeling, the age of the assessment, and it also includes a policy choice regarding the risk of unintentional overfishing. The annual catch limit is the workhorse of federal fishery reference points, and the ACL is what we design management measures to get close to if possible, but not to exceed. There's an optional buffer below the uh, acceptable biological catch down to the ACL, which can be used to account for additional uncertainty, including to address concerns or assumptions about future environmental conditions. Sean talked earlier about scaling harvest opportunities and risk, and I want to point out here that the size of these buffers um, varies with the level of uncertainty as determined by scientists and with the level of risk aversion chosen by policymakers. Importantly, the science part of these buffers can't be reduced through policy decisions. It's hardwired in, and the additional policy buffers are additive. Uh, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll disregard the annual catch target at the bottom of the diagram, 
The take home message from this slide is that there are multiple points at which environmental conditions are considered as we set quotas and regulations for marine fisheries and we build in buffers to protect against uncertainty and risk. Just before we change slides, I also wanna mention that although I'm focusing today on harvest management, uh, that's, that's really just one um, narrow view, one piece of the puzzle. And it's important to know that the, uh, the value of healthy habitats for marine fisheries is clearly recognized in state and federal frameworks as well. Just to provide a couple examples, ODFW's marine program has a long history of nearshore habitat research and the Pacific Fishery Management Council has a standing habitat committee that advises the Council on Habitat Protection. Since our jurisdiction is over fishing activities, uh, we focus most directly on the effect of fishing on habitat. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, sardines uh, provide us with a great example of integrating climate information directly into fisher ma fishery management because we do it explicitly when we set harvest limits at the Pacific Council. This slide shows the sardine harvest control rule, which is used to set the fishery harvest guideline or amount of allowable catch in the uh, direct uh, amount of allowable catch for Pacific sardines off the US West Coast. Control rules in general are the operational component of a harvest strategy. They're essentially pre-agreed guidelines that determine how much fishing is allowed. They may be based on indicators of the targeted stock's status or productivity, both of which are the case here. Uh, and I think if you click, we might see some additional information on the slide. Thanks. The sardine harvest control rule um, incorporates a threshold labeled here as cutoff below which no harvest is allowed in the primary directed fishery for sardines. Although we know that sardine abundance varies widely and is driven by environmental factors much more than fishing, this ensures that fishing is not preventing the stock's capacity to reproduce and rebound when environmental conditions are favorable. And if you click again, please, the control rule also includes a factor based on an ocean temperature index, labeled here as fraction. We know that in the past, the sardine stock has been more productive when the water is warmer, so this control rule provides for a higher rate of fishing in more productive stock conditions and a lower rate when conditions are less productive. We use similar approaches in managing other fisheries as well, as the next and final marine slide has several other examples. Before we go to that slide, uh, I'll remind everyone that the commission will be considering adopting federal rules for sardines and other coastal pelagic species in July. And the staff summary and presentation for that agenda item will have a little more detail on the sardine fishery. So last slide, please. Here are several examples uh, in state managed fisheries. In our pink shrimp and Dungeness crab fisheries, we use measurable criteria that represent the state of the fishery or the population when these criteria indicate an undesirable state, a pre-specified management response is triggered. Climate change is specifically addressed in our pink shrimp fishery management plan. Our harvest strategy uses target and limit reference points to provide more precautionary management during environmentally driven declines in stock abundance. These reference points and responses were developed through ODFW's modeling and input from the shrimp industry in 2014. The most stringent or limit reference point includes an explicit environmental factor, the mean sea level height at Crescent City. This metric reflects the timing and strength of the spring transition in coastal currents and is correlated with improved shrimp larval survival and recruitment. The limit action level is assumed to indicate a relatively severe stock decline and when it's reached, fishing is suspended to provide maximum protection for that year's spawning stock biomass and egg bearing females. In our commercial ocean Dungeness crab fishery, we also use a limit reference point. If the fishery sees a four year decreasing landing trend coupled with certain thresholds for landings and catch per unit effort level, adaptive management actions to reduce fishery impacts are triggered. We would attempt to determine the primary cause of the stock decline and apply the most appropriate management response from a suite of pre-specified options, such as a season or area closure, pot limits, trip limits, or an increase in minimum crab size. While this reference point doesn't include a direct environmental metric, the built-in response to trends in relative abundance 
means that protective measures are triggered when needed to reduce fishery impacts. So to conclude the marine section, precaution is part of our culture and is built into our fishery management frameworks. Even so, we know that climate change may alter the biology and relationships that underpin things like our harvest control rules and reference points. And the data assumptions and action levels that we use are uh, intended to be reevaluated periodically um, <clears throat> so that they reflect the best and most current science. We build our marine fishery management systems to adapt to changing circumstances so that species are protected under adverse conditions, whether or not we have predicted those conditions. And this connects directly to the adaptive management approach in key principle six from the draft policy. Thank you very much. That concludes the marine section. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Commissioner Labhart and then Commissioner Zarnowitz. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Maggie. Um, this will show my little bit of lack of knowledge and Bob will probably jump in here, but how are we, uh, I understand the squid fishery is significantly increased over the last few years. And is that a result of climate change? And if so, or, or is or isn't? And then the second question is, is are you using the same fisheries management uh, criteria techniques to respond to the harvest of squid? Because I understand it's becoming quite an economic engine. Thank you, Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart. Uh, that's a great question. I, I would say we don't know directly whether the, the increase in squid up here in the past several years is due to climate change. Um, we do know that uh, we have seen in, in some of those years, we've seen an expansion of the um, range where squid abundance is high from California up here. Uh, this year, I think there was more of a movement. So I, I think they did not see as many squid down off California, saw more up here. So we had a lot of boats coming to our area. Um, we are uh, going through a, a, a process with our staff and our teams to discuss um, how to respond. We've been talking about what is appropriate to ensure squid conservation. These are very short-lived. They basically have a one-year life cycle. Um, so again, not a, a species we can stockpile, but we do want to be sure that fishery harvest is um, not impairing the ability of the squid population to, to reproduce and, and remain productive. But um, like sardines, I would say it is highly environmentally driven, uh, both in terms of um, its productivity and its distribution. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zarnowitz. Um, yeah, I, um, this is very um, informative, Maggie. I really appreciated um, you going into detail on how the environment, uh, the measures of the environment and the habitats uh, really affect ocean fisheries because uh, it's been pretty obscure to me. Um, when we did the last, uh, the, the ground fish seasons, um, even though I know you did a great presentation then, um, but uh, it's, I really appreciate it. And I think that this fits in well, the, the type of um, uh, use of um, information and, um, applied to management, I think really fits in with the um, policy that we're re looking at today. That's all I have. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Maggie, I have one question. Could you say a little bit more about, you, you mentioned um, policy risk tolerance and that, that how would that come to us or because we may see that next month, but how would we know what we're looking at? How would that come to us? Could you just say a bit more? Sure, thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, there, there are several places um, in the, uh, specifically in the example I showed that had the, the red to green bar. One of the places that the Pacific Council uh, makes a, a policy choice on risk tolerance is, our, is the risk of accidentally exceeding the overfishing limit. And so one of the factors that um, 
uh, that defines the size of the buffer between the overfishing limit and the acceptable biological catch is uh, the council's quantitative decision on that. We, we pick a number basically, and that we cannot exceed 50%. So we, we, there's a, a factor that goes into that. We can choose um, to specify that we want an even lower risk of exceeding the overfishing limit. And basically that is reflecting our confidence in, in where the overfishing limit was set. So we receive uh, a, a really large amount of information on the stock assessments and the stock assessors. And we um, are, are provided with a lot of information on the uncertainty that was in them. And we have the opportunity to to reflect on that and say, given that, and we understand that, that there is the science component of that buffer that was determined based on that amount of uncertainty. And we can basically say, and we're still worried that you might have gotten it wrong and the actual overfishing limit might be lower than you think. And so we want to increase that buffer. The other place, and this might be more relevant for the commission, um, for you all in, in your decisions on these, uh, whether it's federally managed fisheries that we are, for example, bringing to you our, our ground fish package every December or other fisheries, is that um, there is always an opportunity to set lower limit, lower catch limits. Um, you know, for example, here we can set the annual catch limit uh, at, at really anywhere we want, anywhere uh, this would be the Pacific Council wants um, below the acceptable biological catch. And again, we can bring in, um, you know, any additional uncertainty we have or any additional um, uh, you know, conservation concern there. And the commission can do the same thing. When we bring you our ground fish exhibit and we say, here are the federal limits that we have to work with um, for Oregon's commercial and recreational nearshore fisheries, the commission could choose to set the limits even lower than those based on um, some you know, factors that you believe are relevant. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions and then we'll move on to the next panel um, or the next person, Commissioner Woolley and Commissioner Spellbrink. Okay, thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, so Maggie, I was wondering why a four year downward trend is the trigger for reducing or stopping shrimp or crab harvest versus the two years or six years or whatever it is. is it tied to the life histories of those animals? Thanks, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley. Uh, the four year decline is specific to crab, not shrimp. Um, and, and I will say that I was not involved in developing that threshold. So um, I don't think I can speak to that, but I would be happy to get back to you on, on um, whether that is tied uh, specifically to the Dungeness crab life history, or if that time period, for example, was chosen uh, to um, account for normal interannual variability in um, the crab population and fishery dynamics. Okay, thanks. And just another quick question. Are, is most of the crab har harvest um, shipped overseas? I don't know hardly anybody that, oh no, I'm sorry, the sardines. I don't know hardly anybody that eats sardines anymore. And so <laughs> just wondering, like sardines and crackers used to be a thing, you know, many years ago. So are, is that mostly an exported item? Thanks, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley. Uh, right now of, of the sardine harvest that's occurring, which is um, very limited, it is um, mostly being used for live bait in California's recreational ocean fisheries, uh, primarily for highly migratory species like tunas and swordfish. Uh, the, the sardine, there has been no primary directed fishery for sardines uh, since 2015 because of low abundance status. When there is, um, I, I think, yes, a substantial portion of that is exported. Uh, and there's some interest in trying to develop uh, some more local markets and a you know, bigger focus on, on U.S. seafood products and the nutritional value of sardines. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Spellbrink, and then Sean, could you introduce the next piece? Right, I'll be quick here because I know we're kind of short on time. But uh, yeah, I think one of the things uh, answering Commissioner Woolley's uh, question there, I think as I remember, they're on the crab. 
being in, involved like I was for many years with the Dungeness Crab Fishery to uh, to get the the mark of approval for I can't remember what the the abbreviation is there, but for so you could get the sustainable fisheries, I think I think you had to come up with that that if there was a decline in catch over so many different years, uh, then you you would uh, consider some some uh, you know uh, regulation or something. I think that was part of the of the process of getting the label of a, being a sustainable fishery. So that I think that's where that regulation came up, or where that we talked about that. But uh, the question I had was uh, on uh, you talked about the spring transition uh, in ocean oceanographic conditions and how it correlates to recruitment success. Uh, is that information in for this last spring? Uh, do you know how how it looked on this last spring, Maggie? Thanks, Chair Wall, Commissioner Spellbreak. Um, I'm afraid I don't, but I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Okay, I just wondered. It's, uh, I guess, boots on the ground. Uh, <laughs> interesting to know. Thank you. And it was uh, the Marine Stewardship Council. Yeah, that's what it was. Crab. Thank you. Good to go. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners, I just wanted to do a time check. We've got two presentations left. Uh, Chris Kern was going to talk about uh, Coast Coho and their management, and then Tom Stahl was going to talk about um, the Rogue South Coast plan and how we plan to reflect the climate change policy in that planning process. Um, we've got 30 minutes left. If we do both of those, we're probably going to go over. So I just wanted to check whether fall was a hard deadline, or an, and if so, we'd probably prioritize the Rogue South Coast plan. Commissioners, are you okay to go 10 extra minutes or 15 extra minutes? Anybody who is not? I think it's great. Thank you all. Go ahead, Sean. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Uh, so Chris Kern, our uh, Deputy Administrator in the Fish Division is gonna talk about Coast Coho Management. Hey, good afternoon. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Sean, uh, and good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, just talk a little bit about the management regime for the salmon fisheries affecting uh, Oregon Coast wild coho. Um, this framework that's used um, links the metrics for status and performance of the stock directly to the allowable fishing rates and includes uh, use of environmental drivers as part of the process. So it's, it's um, fairly similar to some of the things we've already talked about. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, just uh, wanted to give a little historical context. Some of you may already be aware of these things. Um, heading into the 1980s, our recreational ocean fishery uh, for coho off Oregon was one of the state's largest. Um, and it, the top, top figure shows uh, the number of ocean angler trips in Oregon uh, in blue and the kept catch of coho in orange over time. And you'll see that uh, those early years were relatively large, but by that point, they'd actually dropped a fair bit uh, and they were higher than that prior to that. So by 1986, which is the earliest year on this graph, we'd already been seeing some declines. Uh, and as folks are probably aware, the large decline resulted in the ESA listing for this stock in 1998. Significant reductions in fishery harvests had already begun, uh, begun before that point, uh, including the um, closure to retention of coho in Oregon between 1994 and 1998. The bottom figure is uh, the estimated escapement of the stock uh, to the rivers off the or on the Oregon coast uh, over those same years. And a couple things to just sort of uh, generally acknowledge here is you can see very low numbers in that early period, but you can also see some cycles in the population over recent years. So the population uh, has gone and will continue to go up and down um, with the cycles. And the management framework we're using is meant to adjust harvest during those cycles and to those cycles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I mentioned environmental variables. We've actually got a couple of places um, where those come in. Uh, in 1998, the, P the Pacific Fishery Council adopted the current basic framework for management of harvest on and harvest impacts on wild Oregon coast coho. ODFW was a significant contributor in that process. In fact, did most of, I believe, most of the analytical and um, 
and background work on those things uh, well before my time. But basically the approach is to merge measures of natural production and marine survival to help us gauge how the population is doing in a given year. Marine survival is a large driver for these populations uh, and that's environmentally driven as we've talked about before uh, to a degree. And so incorporating a measure of that in harvest management has been a pretty important aspect to improving the status for these for this stock. The basic framework is still in place, but the details of it have been updated over time. And so um, the changes were made to adapt to new information and changing conditions, which is, I think, very consistent with what we're talking about here today. And again, there's two stages where environmental variables are really applied. One is in this matrix I'm going to describe that defines the maximum uh, annual exploitation that the stock can that, uh, on the stock. And the other is uh, actually in an abundance forecast itself. I, I won't have time to go into the forecast side, but uh, it is using a similar set of inputs as what we're gonna talk about in the matrix itself. So um, that brings me to the next slide. Uh, and this one will have a little bit of animation to it. So thank you, that's the first click and I'll give you a, 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 a prompt for the next one in a bit. Um, we basically got what what I refer to as a is a two dimensional matrix, um, and so the one dimension that you see here is the parental escapement. So this is essentially gauging the natural production of the stock via the escapement in the parent year. Uh, for the cohort of fish we're looking at in a given year's fishery um, discussion, so coho return is three year old adults. So for 2020 fisheries planning, what we looked at was escapement in the parent year, which was 2017. Um, happens that that was in a low category, as were the last couple of years, or uh, yeah, the two years after that, uh, 18 and 19. And so we actually know now that for 21 and 22 fishing seasons, that's the row we will be looking at uh, in terms of fishery planning. So you'll see the, the middle row that's labeled as low. That's, that's where we will be confined to. Um, sorry, you won't see that yet. You'll see a more complete row in a minute. Um, if you could do the second click. So the other dimension to this matrix is the marine survival. Uh, and this is intended basically, uh, I like to think of it as a way to capture how well the production that we just tried to characterize in the first dimension might do while they're in the ocean. Uh, this one we don't have uh, so far ahead of time. And that's actually a good thing because we're using more real time, not quite real time, but much closer in time environmental data to sort of assess what that survival may be. And that uh, I'll talk about it a little more in a bit, but that's one of the things that's been updated um, within the last uh, several years. Uh, and then the third, uh, click again, please. So the, the essential way to look at this matrix is, is the lower left area is both low return and low survival. And so that's the worst conditions. And then as you move sort of over up and to the right, uh, you go into greater, um, better conditions, both from a survival standpoint and an abundance standpoint uh, for the parent year. So um, if you go ahead and click one more time. So when conditions are poor, the fisheries are more constrained and they can only be liberalized when the conditions improve. So uh, I think Sean alluded to this earlier and, and it's come up in some other ways as well. Uh, from a climate and ocean change perspective in this matrix, we would expect that under more frequently occurring poor conditions for coho, we will by default be more frequently in those poor zones of the matrix. Um, now I'll point out this matrix, we have actually three major population strata for the OCN stock group. Uh, and in a given year, the ocean fisheries would be subjected, uh, constrained within whatever the lowest of those are. So most often they're pretty similar uh, and of course they will only differ in their parent escapement number, but where we have a weak component in a given year, that is the driver for the limitation for those fisheries. So uh, for instance, if we were to have one strata that was in a very high status and one very low, we would be managing as if everything was in the very low category. Uh, and I think this is a place to point out that that's, I believe is, is uh, kind of reflected in the key management principle one, to protect and conserve first and foremost, but then scale use in a way that avoids undermining that conservation. Uh, I mentioned this matrix has already been modified a few times uh, for new information and it can be modified again as needed. 
Um, Maggie mentioned it as well, the, the salmon management plan the council uses as well as most of their plans, if not all. Um, the salmon plan has an annual methodology review process that, that is really intended to allow and, and um, um, for the, just this kind of adaptation. It has been used uh, several times before. So the last and final click on this slide, please. I just wanted to point out a couple of places that have been modified since the first version of this matrix was, was adopted in 1998. Um, we saw some very poor returns basically immediately after this, this process started uh, in 1998 through the year 2000. And so in uh, 2000, the council added this critical spawner level row. So that's the very bottom row uh, on, you see the arrow on the left. Um, and also, I believe they reduced the rates that that row contained. Um, and then in 2014, uh, ODFW did some analysis to reassess the survival component, and we were able to provide a uh, improved methodology for doing um, uh, for estimating the survival. Uh, and then just a few years prior to that, actually, the abundance forecast had been updated to also incorporate marine variables. So these are these are areas that are consistent with the second key management principle in that it's been up, this approach has been updated uh, based on new understandings, which include some changing in conditions probably. And also we have a mechanism for continued adaptation into the future. Um, this matrix sets the maximum allowables as a ceiling. Uh, it is common for these fisheries to be planned to use less than that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One being that um, the salmon management plan the council uses is fundamentally centered around weak stock management. And so the need to meet conservation objectives for other stocks can really um, constrain the ability to fully use allowable rates for any number of other stocks. Uh, and that's intentional. And then certainly the council can and has adopted uh, rates for a given fishing season that are below that allowable level due to things like forecast uncertainty or other factors. So I'll move to the next slide, please. And this one is just to kind of give you an idea of, of how this approach has functioned over time. So what I've done here is tallied up the frequency uh, of occurrence, really, of each of those cells within that matrix uh, since it started in 1998. And as I pointed out, these show just what the allowable rates were in that year, not necessarily what the actual rates were. Um, and uh, the black numbers in the parentheses will, will correspond to what you saw on the prior slide. The bold red numbers are the frequency, so how many times we've been there. Uh, the very low and critical parental years, those are all from 1998 through 2001, and we have not had one of those since, which is a good thing. Uh, and as I mentioned, those were the drivers for adding that row. Uh, also since 2000, uh, sorry, um, we've also not seen a marine survival category yet that matches the high column. So you'll note there are no red numbers in that column. We're most often, you can probably see, we're most often somewhere in the low to high parental escapement or the low to medium uh, projected survival. For the last few years from 2018 through um, last year, or actually this year, we've been in the low survival category. So that's that second column. Um, and that's not a surprise. You can see that reflected in the annual abundance as we've seen over those years. Um, the examples where we've had really low, ex, uh, the extremely low survival column, those were 1998 and again in 2008. Uh, next slide. And this is this is my last slide. I uh, wanted to show you a couple things here. Um, the x-axis here is again year as on the first one I showed, and the y-axis is the Total is a total exploitation rate. So the blue line is the observed uh, exploitation rate on wild uh, OC and coho over time. And that's across all fisheries. Uh, there's a very small impact up in Alaska and BC for some of these fish. Uh, and then the majority of the rest are down here uh, in council fisheries, as well as in years where they occurred, there would be freshwater impacts in here as well. The black line is the maximum allowable rate that was in place from a management standpoint for each year. And then the red line is uh, the rate that was expected uh, based on a year's planned fisheries. And the reason I wanted to show this here is you can see that in most years, uh, certainly since the implementation of this new, uh, not well, not new now, of the new approach that was implemented in 1998, um, 
we the planned fisheries are actually not expected to use the full allowable rates. It does it has occurred sometimes, but in most cases not. And I talked about some of the reason for that. One of which is, uh, particularly in some of the recent years, an intentional uh, sort of response to some increased forecast uncertainty uh, or other factors. So just on average, uh, and you can see it in the inset there, since 1998, these preseason plans have allocated about 20% less than what's allowed. And uh, the actual impacts have generally also um, been well below, uh, averaging about 30% less than what was even planned. So when you put those two factors together over the time that this approach has been in place, again, uh, recognize that it has been adjusted and changed a little bit over time. But looking at all the years on average, we've had fisheries uh, utilize only about 55% of the maximum amount that we talked about earlier. Um, and that really, uh, I maybe should have thought about a better wrap up slide, but that is, that is my last slide. So if we've got time, I could take questions. Commissioners, are there questions? I don't see any hands raised right now. Chris, I do have one question and that is with ocean conditions being um, seeming to play a bigger and bigger role um, and being relatively variable or uncertain, have we had to use increasing over time, increasing um, buffers? Uh, thanks, Chair Wall. Um, we have used in a little bit more of a buffering approach. Um, I would I would say the other thing that I think is significant is that 2014 adjustment to sort of update the model. What what that contained was when this thing was uh, first implemented in 1998, we were working with the data we had in hand at that time, and since that time. Um, a number of things have occurred that have improved the data, one of which is a significant number of what we call life cycle monitoring sites along the coast. And so these are um, uh, targeted projects that do what we, you know, you'd probably call it a fish in, fish out sort of assessment, where we can really get a much better sense of what the survival rate for the population we're really looking at, the wild coho, is. And that has allowed for this exercise that was done in 2014, where we looked at where our staff looked at those real survival rates uh, and then correlated those to a number of environmental variables. And so I think what we wanna do is, is continue to track those to see how well it continues to explain that survival. And if we start to see that that performance of that model isn't as good as it should be or as it could be, then we can update that model. And so that would, that would allow us to uh, adapt to changing um, conditions in the ocean. We're using things like right now, like um, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the spring transition date, upwelling, a number of factors that we do think will signal that those, those sort of effects. I will say on the forecast side, so this is specific to the matrix, which isn't actually the forecast. Um, we did have, uh, several years ago, we had a, a relatively large overestimate in the forecast. And for the years since then, we've been a little, uh, we've been, uh, it's not a direct buffer on the forecast, but we have basically tried not to allocate all the impacts ahead of time if, if leave a little bit of room. And that is partially in response to that. I think some of that is because we know the ocean is really doing pretty poorly over the last several years. So I don't know that the need for that in a year where the ocean is showing better signs would be the same. Um, but that's sort of the approach we've been taking. I, I don't know if it was a long attempt to answer your question. I don't know if I was successful or not, but. <laughs> you did, no, that was that was quite helpful. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sure. the presentation and we'll move back to you then, Sean. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, Chair Wall Commissioners, I hope that these uh, short series of presentations has given you some sense for the management frameworks that we use to scale harvest and then um, some of the ways we bring in environmental variables to adapt in real time in, in the same year. Um, we're going to shift now to planning and how um, in, in the policy itself, uh, it directs us to incorporate the key principles into our planning processes. 
And so Tom Stahl is going to, our conservation recovery manager, is going to talk about the Rogue South Coast plan that's currently under development now and how they're thinking of incorporating these key, key principles. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sean. Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Mel Melcher, my name is Tom Stahl. I'm the Conservation and Recovery Program Manager for the department. And as Sean said, I'm gonna to try to give you some idea of how uh, the planning that we do as an agency um, relates to the climate and ocean po change policy. Plans are very important for the agency. Um, they are how we set direction for species management and on the fish side of things, our native fish conservation policy, which was adopted in 2002 into administrative rule is really what guides conservation planning. Um, the basic principle of the native fish conservation policy is that naturally produced fish are foundational for conservation and fishing opportunity. That's something very consistent with the climate change policy. And that's something that's, that's been around for a long time in terms of the foundation for conservation principles. We wanna make sure that all species and species diversity is maintained. And as, as the words uh, of Aldo Leopold um, were over 70 years ago, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to make sure we keep all the pieces. So that really is an objective of the native fish conservation policy and, and the climate change policy. So we've been um, developing conservation plans as a result of the conservation, the native fish conservation policy for, for a, a while. Um, we've done a lot of work on this. The map here shows the locations where we've done some plans indicated by the circles we, we've either completed or um, have in process 16 different plans um, covering 33 different species management units. One of those plans that's happening in the Rogue South Coast area, I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, in detail in a second. Um, and climate change is something that has been incorporated into these plans, many of these plans, if not most of them over the last decade, the plans developed in that time frame. Um, though how we have dealt with and addressed climate change in those plans has changed through time. So with that, could I have the next slide? Next. There we go. Thank you. So the climate and ocean change policy really is intended to link the, the science piece with the management piece. And, and that really plays out in how we're planning and how that gets developed. Um, so the policy itself is providing direction and guidance to make to uh, conduct analyses, science based analyses that inform the goals and the strategies. Um, and we'll be incorporating those into the plans and how they're implemented. Um, the policy also calls for prioritizing areas for habitat protection and restoration, which is also uh, has, a, has a nexus in these plans. Um, and finally, the plans really do tackle what the research and monitoring should be going into the future for the species that they're addressing. So with that, the next slide, please. So we are in the midst of developing a, a multi-species conservation and management plan in the Rogue South Coast area. Um, it's dealing with four different species management units, winter steelhead, summer steelhead, coho, and cutthroat trout, um, the, the anadromous salmonids in that area, which we don't already have a conservation plan for. Um, the plan is still under development. We are currently working with stakeholders to um, discuss the management strategies in the plan. Um, so we don't have any final products for this plan yet. We're developing the pieces of it. Uh, we hope to have a first full draft of the plan by late summer, if all goes um, according to the schedule we've developed and potentially have a plan to the commission and in draft form for a first look, possibly by the end of the year, which is a little bit delayed from uh, what we had originally intended due to the pandemic. This plan is really um, shows kind of where the kind of where we are and, and the, the kind of cutting edge pieces that we're, we're including into plans as re resulting from our climate change uh, thinking and what needs to be involved in planning. Uh, the first big piece is, is around the future status um, 
previous plans. Uh, we look at current status, desired status, and climate change has been um, a, a piece of those. Uh, in this plan, the Rogue South Coast plan, we are looking at more having it be its own chapter, if you will, a featured section um, where we're doing more sophisticated uh, analyses looking into the future um, using um, climate projection models uh, at a pretty fine scale, at a reach scale, and also looking at how they integrate with different species um, models relating to species distribution and viability into the future. So we're bringing those things together to really get a feel for what the future might look like in a, in a much more precise fashion than we have done in other plans. Um, the, this future status will, will serve to inform the context for the current status or what the fish are telling us how, how things are now. Um, and also really elucidate some of the challenges we will have in achieving our desired status through the management, st the management uh, strategies. Uh, the next big piece, <clears throat> excuse me, around um, climate change is really thinking about how it affects the management strategies. You've heard a lot about this through some of the other presentations. Um, harvest is something that will be scaled to the health uh, of the species involved where you're um, harvesting at a, at a lower level when things don't look good and at a higher level when things are looking better. Uh, harvest is also um, being managed to protect special life history and maintain life history diversity, for instance, by closing certain times of the year when um, there's a, a more unique life history that's present. Um, we are also making sure that uh, we are using hatchery programs responsibly. Um, in, this, in the Rogue South Coast Plan, their hatchery programs are primarily providing fishing opportunity and serving to um, mitigate for, for lost production above dams. Um, but we wanna make sure those hatchery programs are assuring the diversity and not affecting the diversity of the naturally produced fish. Um, and hatchery programs in the future may also become a recovery tool. I'm not talking about the Rogue South Coast plan right here, but um, in some places, hatchery programs are an, a, a true conservation tool where we um, have lost significant natural production and a lot of the diversity of those naturally produced fish are found in the hatchery program. We are also um, dealing with overarching habitat strategies, actions and priorities at a watershed scale. You've heard a lot about this today, what Anna mentioned before in terms of assessing priorities. We're looking at doing that in this plan and, and referencing that. Um, so we are really focused in, in, at, in doing um, habitat protection and restoration at a scale that's meaningful in the future um, to conserve these populations at, in the area. Um, the management stra strategies are all also couched in an adaptive management um, setting where we are able to uh, change through time what the management uh, looks like. And that's largely going to be based on the last thing on this slide, which is research and monitoring. Um, we're in here, here in, in the Rogue South Coast Plan. Uh, more than other plans, we are looking specifically at climate relative, uh, relevant monitoring um, and calling for flow and temperature monitoring specifically to uh, help inform and calibrate the models we're using to assess uh, future status. Um, and compared to what our previous model predictions were to what, what they are um, going forward as we get new information. Um, and, and we'll also be using them to reassess the future in the future. Um, the other thing we're doing with data derived from research and monitoring is um, integrating climate variables or environmental variables uh, from both the freshwater and ocean uh, into our return forecasting, which is used um, or can be used to manage harvest. Um, and that would be moving into the future. Right now in the Rogue South Coast Plan, we don't feel like we have any climate um, data that's at a suitable scale and time frame of our historical population fish information to integrate those into forecasts at this time. 
but that's something we would really like to incorporate and um, get into our, our forecast in the future. With that, that sums up the big pieces that are um, included in plans relative to climate change, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Commissioners, any questions? Tom, I have a couple. One of them is you mentioned doing habitat restoration and protection at a, a level that's meaningful. Could you say more about what that is and if it's if it's ODF and W that would be doing that? Are we asking other people to do that? Or we're actually in this plan more into the habitat protection and restoration work ourselves? So Chair Wall, th these plans um, are intended to guide uh, ODFW's implementation. And as part of that implementation on the habitat side, we are partnering and collaborating with, with numerous other agencies, entities, um, organizations. So um, ODFW will continue that. This plan and, and the, the habitat piece are intended to help guide that. Um, at, again, at a meaningful scale. Uh, some of that is, is, is happening already. As, as I think you're aware, there's uh, strategic action plans happening at a watershed scale, for instance, in Elk River. Um, and this plan will really support that type of ongoing action. Thank you. Anyone else with questions for Tom? Yes. Commissioner Laphart. Yep, thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, Tom, not really a climate change question, but, but somewhat related for the rogue South Coast when you're having your meetings there, and I fully realize you're still having your meetings, you still have a ways to go, but how is the perception from the user groups and the interest groups and the public with the future status management strategies, research and monitoring being received uh, down there regarding this information that you just talked about? Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, um, we are integrating climate concepts into management strategies. So far uh, with the stakeholders, we're, we, we haven't given details around the future status uh, at that point. We've, we've certainly indicated that um, things look challenging, um, but what we are, we are developing the plan in, in sequential pieces, the stakeholders the part of the public process we're in now meeting with stakeholders. We're really focusing on the, the, the fishing and hatchery side of things um, with the protective um, principles underlying those. And as Sean mentioned earlier, that's kind of that's that's more at a near-term time frame. As we start talking about all of the habitat needs for this plan, which hasn't happened yet. Uh, that's where we will roll out to these stakeholders and additional stakeholders that, that have more specific habitat interests, exactly what that future status is looking like. So we really haven't gotten a huge amount of feedback so far on that, that future status piece, and, and that's yet to come. Okay, thank you. One last question I would have, Tom, is on the, you were talking about climate has been incorporated over the last decade. Can you give a couple examples of what you're thinking when you say that? Sure. Um, so let's see, the, the most recent plan that was adopted was the conservation plan for lampreys by the commission in December. Um, there was a piece in there where we looked at a species distribution model for lamprey and projected into the future. So we had some maps. The, the data we have for lamprey aren't, aren't as good as we have for the species in the Rogue South Coast plan, the Salmonids. So um, we felt Although it was useful in that plan, it, it's not going to play as much. It didn't play in that plan as much of a central role as it will in this plan. Um, the plan before that we adopted was the Coastal Multi-Species Plan, the, that's otherwise known as the CMP. Um, that had had a, a significant section in the habitat piece about climate change, and we integrated the the harvest scaling into that by actually developing a specific. Um, sliding scale that would be more protective at certain times and allow more fishing opportunity at other times. And, and again, that's with the anticipation 
like Sean showed that, that, that things are cyclic and those cycles might get worse through time due to climate change. Um, but as things are good, we're going to try to provide opportunity and um, pull back on that in bad times. Those are some of the examples. Other, other plans earlier on, the Lower Columbia Conservation Recovery Plan, for instance, noted climate change and, and really it talked about it in very broad terms. Um, but, and it also added some um, species abundance um, buffer on top of what, what we would have had uh, without climate change considerations. Um, and so that was one approach that was taken at that point. So those are the types of things we, we've done in the past. Thank you, that's really helpful, thanks. We've had two hands go up, so two more questions if you can stand it, Tom. Um, Commissioner Woolley first. Okay, thanks and thanks for everyone's patience. So Tom, it's good that so many specific plants have come out of the native fish conservation policy. Uh, and so given that it's uh, 18 years old now, do you feel that it still has legs moving into the future or do you feel that it may be up for some revisions or updating? Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley. Um, I think it definitely has legs, if you will. The, the principles on which the native fish conservation policy are, are directly derived from our, our agency mission um, and support that. Uh, and it's, it's very consistent with what you're considering for this climate and ocean change uh, policy. Um, there have been places over the years where we felt like the policy was a little bit salmon and steelhead centric and it's a little bit harder to adapt to, adapt to other species. So there might be a few tweaks in there. Um, but the, the underlying principles of, of conservation and utilization and how we think about that are, are things that you know, are, are driven by our mission, which um, hopefully drives us for a long time into the future. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Um, yeah, I just wanted to find out when it says research and monitoring, um, does that include doing maybe more uh, species um, uh, su such as uh, annual uh, spawner surveys and that type of thing? Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, um, it does. It, in, it entails looking at the research we're doing now. There, there is on the ground work happening. Um, looking at that in the, the range of needs around the management strategies and climate change um, that would shift what we're doing now. Um, for this particular plan, um, adult abundance numbers are, are things that uh, we have less data on and is something that we are definitely thinking about getting more data on um, as a result of this plan. I just wanna say also, I, I worked with Tom on various uh, projects in the South Coast and uh, it's good to see you doing what you're doing now. And I like uh, what the overall plan for this uh, South Coast road plan. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think that's it on our questions. So we would give um, Sean and Davi a chance to say any last words. And it looks like Director Melcher would like to say something as well. Um, and I do have one or two closing things I just want to mention. So Sean and Davia, anything final or are you good to go? Uh, I think Davia was going to wrap up here. I just want to say thank you for your time um, and questions. Thank you. Chair Wall, commissioners, thanks so much for the opportunity to present you all with this information. I just wanted to bring it back at the end here to the policy um, and remind you of where we've been and where we're going. Um, so uh, we had a series of public meetings at the end of 2019 and brought the policy draft as an informational to you in January. Um, the plan was to, to bring it for adoption in April and uh, the current schedule is to, to do that on July 10th. Um, so we'll go through the details of the policy at that time. But I really hope that this time was um, helpful in providing some uh, examples of what implementing the policy looks like and uh, helped you learn a little bit more about what's happening uh, around the agency and I'm happy to answer uh, more questions going forward if you have them. Okay.
Great. Director Meltzer, did you want to say something before I mention a couple things? Uh, I guess I would just first uh, say thanks to the commissioners for joining us here for three plus hours and um, you're in luck. We're going to have uh, another three plus hours for you tomorrow. Um, probably three plus five at least, I would guess. But nonetheless, <laughs> I wanted to thank you for that. I, and then I just wanted to thank Davia and Sean for uh, really taking the lead on this presentation. I uh, just in all you know, full disclosure, I, this is the first time I've seen the presentation. So um, and I thought it was quite, quite nicely done and very informative and uh, included a lot of things that we've been working on for years here. Um, and we're really kind of bringing them all, bringing them all home together under this new uh, climate and ocean adaptation policy. So with that, thanks a lot. I'll let you close it out and we'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Um, and I do want to say thank you to any of the public who might be still listening and thank you for your time and your interest if you are there. Um, mostly I would like to say thank you to the department for the leadership in creating this. It was a remarkable set of, of presentations and it was almost an inspiring level of, of expertise. It's just stunning what this department has as resources and I bet I speak for everybody on the commission when I say that. Um, it also, as I hear the whole thing, um, it really is, I was impressed with this before, but the, the sophistication and the nuance of how this has been integrated is pretty um, stunning, I would say. So thank you all for that and to the commissioners for doing this workshop and, and your questions and that sort of thing. I bet there are a couple of commissioners that might want to have a last word, but mostly thank you to the department for this workshop and for the incredible amount of work that went into it. So any commissioner want to say anything or are we going home? How's that for stopping you from talking? I'm, I would just say thank you again. Oh, I just saw my internet connection was unstable. People can, I just want to say thank you because of time that have gone into this we're just sitting through three hours and so this these sorts of presentations there's hours and hours of time involved so i just want to thank everybody that worked on this it, it was informative it was detailed uh, so i just want to give my thanks to everybody yeah, very impressive okay thank you all and enjoy your evening and be ready for a very long day today or tomorrow sorry <laughs> Thank so you. see you at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. So.